Thank you, Chad. So quiet. It's pondering and reading those questions ahead of time because everyone put them in before seven. It was good yesterday. Someone asked that question about F1 and I was able to, in the time frame between the time they asked it and to the top of the show, I had gotten an answer from F1. <laughs> yeah, that was great. <laughs> that was useful. Sam, what is this thing? Oh, that's just the time of day. Yeah, you show a little bit of your power. <laughs> uh, contacts. <laughs> you know, you you just do anything for a long enough time. I mean, you know, it helps when you're uh, your former employee. Kristen, the the test question is still up on the deck. No pressure, but the te test question is definitely definitely up. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. If you're watching on YouTube, yeah, you can find out more about what we do at officehours.global. Our first hour is general discussion about media and virtual production. Second hour is usually something that we'd like to spend a little more time on. Today, we're going to spend a little more time on general discussion. <laughs> Saturday, Saturday is more of a, a general discussion day. So we've got lots of room for questions. We have a great panel here today. So um, for the uh, producers out there, go ahead and throw those questions in. Um, we'll uh, We've got a, a good number to start with, but I know that we'll burn through those. Uh, so, uh, so go ahead and start throwing them in. All right, let's uh, jump to the first question. Uh, take it away, Mitch. Thank you, Alex. Andy Carluccio is here from San Francisco, California. Amazon EC2 M1 Mac instances were announced yesterday at 0.6565 cents an hour with a 24 reservation requirement. So just under $16 per day. What do you think? Is this the key to adding Mac OS applications to cloud production systems? Go ahead, Grant. Yeah, I, I had to play with this when they first um, put Macs on, on EC2. And uh, it was a bit clunky because you're, it's actually dedicated hardware, which is why there's that 24 hour reservation. And so, um, of course, like with all um, Amazon services, AWS services, um, you can really get stung really quickly. And, and if you if you tip over into the next 24 hour period, then that's a whole nother 24 hour period. Um, and, uh, and that can add up pretty quickly. So I still don't think that the cost is quite right. Um, ideally, it's a fully virtual um, environment, Mac environment, which I'm not sure we're ever going to get to. Um, so I, I, I guess if you can, if you can uh, organize it in such a way that you can say, okay, I just need it for this day, and then the startup sequence is that it sucks down everything that it needs to, to, uh, to run, and then it can sort of automate it and script it all, I guess so. There's just a lot of work in that. I still think just running it um, local is still where we're at. That cost is too high. Go ahead, Nigel. 
Yeah, I was going to say much more, Grant said, I, I did the, ma- the math, as we say in America, maths, as we say in the rest of the world, um, and you take $1,000 and you divide by that and you're into 65 days, so that's your break-even point. If you have 65 days worth, buy your own one. Obviously, it's hard to, to do the cloud integration, but the apps I've seen people use don't necessarily work well on a Mac in a virtual environment. So I think it's useful if you want to test something, but I think it's a short-term test thing, not a long-term production thing. All right, go ahead, Mitchell. We were talking yesterday of whether Apple would allow this, uh, and the general consensus was that Apple doesn't care because they're selling boxes. So why would they matter if something's up on the on the cloud? So yeah, it'll be an interesting been a, experiment. There have been, there have been. I mean, Amazon's done this before. I think even Apple even was part of the announcement, and uh, there's been Mac Stadium, which is another one that that does this already. So you know, having these there, I think that there's it's really interesting, especially if you look at like. Uh, uh, Zoom ISO and some of the other things that are out there that, that you know, being able to have those running on a Mac, you know, in the cloud um, could be pretty, it's pretty interesting, you know, and <clears throat> the efficiency of the of the Macs are, are pretty outstanding. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, you can get a lot of feeds, both SDI and NDI out of the, out of the Mac, the M1s. And so I think that there's some, and I think that they're more efficient than, I think that, that we're going to find um, that the, the M1s are more efficient than a lot of the other EC2 instances when it comes to running something that is powerful enough to push a lot of feeds out, you know, so so we may find that it's actually less expensive to use the Mac for some features. Uh, go ahead, Mitchell. How would you get around um, interconnecting something like uh, with Zoom ISO, we use a DeckLink card. And, you mean NDI? Yeah, oh, so excuse you, me, NDI. NDI. Right. NDI feeds, yeah. So we've done it definitely from a Mac to a PC to get into vMix or something like that. So so you could use NDI to get out of that. And and again, it's the M1s are kind of astounding, you know, and what and what and what they can put out, especially when it comes to the video because they're optimized for video. So the the you can put a lot out and they're not being hammered very hard, you know. So so I think it's it's um I think you're gonna find that there are definitely things, not just Mac things that you can run on it. I think it's really good for Memo Live <laughs> and Softron and other folks. And people who already have a, 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 Mac pla- a Mac workflow that don't necessarily want to create a new workflow, but do want to do stuff in the cloud. Um, I think that there's some really interesting possibilities there. And again, I think that we're going to find if we want to use something that's going to pump out a bunch of um, ISOs or, or whatever that the, that the EC2 instance in that case, especially if you're building up for a production, charging an extra, extra whatever, 60 or or $100 for the for all the computers that you're going to use in the cloud for that week or whatever, isn't that, isn't that big of a deal? So it'll be interesting to see. We'll do, do they it. have yeah. uh, dedicated Macs or is it a virtual machine on some kind of server? I'm going to guess that they're dedicated Macs. Macs are hard to virtualize that way. So I'm going to guess that that's, that's how they're approaching that. Go ahead, Serge. Yeah, they are dedicated M1 to uh, Mac Mini. Yeah. Uh, that's next what question. I read. Next question. Next question is for me. You get to ask one once in a while. This one's what's the perfect camera setup to feed video to an A10 Mini Extreme? Nigel. I feel like this is a trick question because the answer won't be a Sony camera. The, son, the answer is a Blackmagic camera. I mean, um, obviously the perfect may be an Ari, but for most of us, the Blackmagic 6K, um, 6K Pro, one of those straight into port one of your A10 Mini seems like the, the obvious answer because of the grading and control. Yeah, go ahead, Mitchell. I don't want to make this a, a debate over Sony versus Blackmagic design, but uh, I was just curious about the the perfect uh, frame rate uh, the, uh, as far as uh, what what does the ATEM really want to see so that there's consistency across all your inputs. Well, if you're streaming uh, or going to, you know, most things are optimized for 30 frames a second, some version of 30 frames a second. So if you're using a frame rate other than that, if you're giving it 60 frames a second, typically a lot of stuff nowadays youtube and facebook will support 60 because they support games um you know and and this by the way is one of the reasons that we're seeing a slow move to 120 frames a second it's one of the big factors for that is gaming you know gaming game streaming is is wants to go to 120 and so does sports so sports want to be at 120 game streaming wants to be at 120 it turns out they're the only things that really matter because of the only things that are i mean you can still go back and watch your 24 frame per second movies but um you know that but as far as like broadcast the only thing making money is live <laughs> so so um you know and so the uh um so i think that you're going to keep on seeing higher frame rates there but but i think that 
the many, uh, you know, most platforms like Zoom aren't going to support right now. I don't think support more than 30. So probably 30 frames a second is is probably a good target there uh, or 29.97. I mean, we've had a bunch of conversations about this recently and 29.97 is the right way to go. It should all work. Uh, 29.7 is only just slightly, <laughs> you know, slightly fast, slower than, than 30, but it is a different frame rate and uh, it will cause trouble in some hardware. So um, people go, well, I'll just set it to 30. Uh, it's not the same. So uh, you really do want to have it at 29.97. Um, next question. Thank you. And the question comes in from Chris Widener, Lafayette, Indiana. Samson Q9U Dynamic Microphone XLR USB versus the Shure MV7 for a roundtable panel setup. Is the bump in price worth it for an interview format show for a local brewer using a link that they're showing there? And I'm concerned about spillage. Go ahead, Mitchell. I have to ask, what kind of spillage? Is it beer spillage? Beer. Uh, beer. Or it's is it uh, audio spillage? Okay. It's a beer place. Uh, go ahead, Serge. I'm sure we have someone with their Shure microphone, but I have the Samsung Q9U right now, so you can judge by the quality of my son or not. It sounds good. Now, what is it running into? Is it just the USB? XLR to flow it. Okay. Yeah, it sounds good. It sounds good. I When I saw this question, I went ahead and we're always trying to find a less expensive mic that we can use, you know, for sending it out to kits. So I went ahead and ordered one. So I'll yeah, have it soon. That's, a, that's the reason I bought that, that microphone. That's yeah. pretty cheap. Yeah, so I, I, it on paper it looks like it would sound as good, but it's really hard to know until you um, until we test it. Like, and the key with all of these mics is getting them all in one place. So I'm slowly collecting. I've decided I'm not collecting mics over two hundred dollars. <laughs> I'm getting the ones that I think I need, but under that, I'm starting to kind of collect them because I'm trying to find the mic that I can use. And and the problem is, is I I wanted to buy them and send them back, but the issue is, is that I need them all in the same place at the same time. You know, to listen to like, how does this one look? Sound to this one, this one. So I got this is the little one that David Brady had responded to. I, I haven't tested it yet, but it's it's here, and um, and so we'll and so we'll keep on playing with those. Go ahead, Grant. Yeah, I think um, obviously audio quality um, is a is a key thing. That's first thing you're thinking about. Um, but in this case, I would also think about build quality um, and just the uh, the the its ability to be kind of thrown around in your well, I, I can tell you that, that the that the 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 MV7 is not something that can be thrown around. <laughs> yeah, right. I, Nothing I, like the SM58. Yeah, this is I this is one of the MV7s and I put this in my bag and I just didn't wrap it very well and it got out of its little sleeve and it was all scratched. Now, I have this 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 front area is you'll notice that it's shinier. Um I used a very high-tech way to get those scratches all across this. I mean, it, almost no movement at all. And it was just, and I was like, I can't use this on air. Um, and you'll notice it's a little shinier because I used a very high tech um, fix it thing for this, this side. You'll notice that it's a little bit more matte on this side. I used a flat, a flat Sharpie <laughs> and it worked perfectly. You can't tell. It picks up, it picks up uh, fingerprints a little bit better. But uh, anyway, so it's, it's this way. Right? The Sharpie, it was actually the Sharpie itself that fixed this. So you, you can fix these. Um, I've been thinking about taking the Sharpie and putting it over top of the, the actual logo as well, just to get rid of the logo. Um, but is, it, is that a metal casing? It is a metal casing, but it's just that the, that the paint is not durable. You know, like it's, so it, it, you definitely with an MV7, you have to wrap it carefully uh, and not let it touch anything else that's remotely hard. Uh, so then the question is, is this, is the, um, uh, the Samson. Um, I know. And I think what we need to do is just throw two of them into a bag and take a hike, come back and see which one, which one fared better. <laughs> anyway, so, um, we'll, we'll do some more mic, uh, head to heads, um, in, in the near future. So we'll see, we'll see what people think. Uh, next question. Jens Olson from Sandpoint, Idaho. What recorder would you use if you're tired of waiting for your friends to record an album? And just want to record their live shows so you don't have to listen to iPhone voice memo recordings. <laughs> uh, go ahead, uh, Craig. Uh, 
depending on the console, most uh, most shows now have, have some form of digital console. Uh, anything from a X32 up can usually have either a USB out or um, have, have some connection for a multi-track or even just two-track out. Uh, most of them also have uh, a USB slot on the face where you can plug in a key and do a two-track uh, record right away. So that would be my first bet. Uh, after that, I'd go with a Dante solution. I go grunt. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing, that um, the chances are in, the, in some, even the smaller venues that there's a, a console that you could do multi-track record. And I, and I would suggest doing multi-track. So it, all it means is bringing a laptop along with enough hard drive space on it um, and a, and some uh, door software, you know, that, that you're able to um, do one for one all of the inputs. Um, it's definitely the way to do it because then you could do a, a still even a rough mix um, of that when you in post production, um, and that would be a, a great way. Uh, I do that regularly for for those types of shows, smaller sort of bands and things, and you're able to mix together something really quite uh, quite good that's not in a studio um, until you get the the money and the time to go into a studio and do a proper album. Yeah, you may find some sensitivity. Um connecting to someone's Dante network, there'll be, they'll, that you will find there are some people in houses that for good reason, to my, in my experience, that won't let you connect to their Dante or to their Maddie network. So they, they'll they just be like, no, you can't do that. Because it, it I, I, I may or may not have delayed a very big show by connecting to Maddie. So, so anyway, so the clocking can become, a, become an issue. Um, you know, so, uh, uh, so there may be a, with, again, they may have good reason if it's a, if it's a smaller place and they, they have a little X32 and they have some Dante, they might let you grab onto it. If it's a larger show, uh, or a bigger venue, they probably won't let you be on the network, um, to do that. So you have to kind of think through that. If they have a way to get to XLR outputs or, you know, to, to balanced outputs, um, all of them, if you can. Um, then you can get something like a, then you can build your own network. So what we've kind of moved towards is uh, we'll bring stage boxes and drop them in. Uh, you know, if we want to do something with all those channels and we just have them give us XLR out, <laughs> you know, and then it's just analog out. There's no clocking. There's no digital interface or whatever. It just goes from theirs to ours. Um, and then ours, so we have our own network. They have their own network. Um, and this is for a lot of tracks. These are like more than 50 you know, tracks that are coming out, you know, sometimes as high as 90, 95 tracks. So you have to have a couple of these boxes if you want to do it. Um, another thing that can handle it that has just a breakout is a Joko. Uh, Joko is something we used in our studio. We have one now that is on Dante, but you can get Joko will, you know, connect to all kinds of different things, analog being one of them. It's a recorder. It's a one U recorder. You put a USB stick into it. It's just designed to go. You hit record and it just grabs all the channels. It has a little iPad app too, which is kind of cool. But it's about $3,200. Uh, if you can get on the on the network, then something like Reaper or there's another one called Boom Recorder that, that can also record. Be very careful if your laptop is an M1. So there are some issues with the M1. Um, it's the Apple MIDI audio units, whatever that it gets caught between part of it thinks it's 32 bit and part of it thinks it's 24 bit. And what you end up with is a blank, not, not a space, but blank audio every 96,000 frames or 96,000 samples. Um, and it ruins it just in case you wonder, <laughs> ruins, the, ru ruins, the, ruins the, the samples. So, so, um, so be careful of the M ones right now with using uh, Dante as an input. Um, it's something that we're not doing anymore. Um, go ahead, Craig. I was just going to ask, is that a delay of show story an after hour story or? Uh... No, it's, it's, not, it's not a show. It's not something else to share. I just say it's a bad idea. I will never do that again. It's one of those things. It, it, didn't, it wasn't horrible. It just was stressful. And I'm not certain it's us, but, but the, we were the only other new variable. So, so I worry about that. Um, next question. Paul Valhus in Austin, Texas. My Mac M1 is clicking. Should I be worried? I go ahead, Serge. The only thing I could think of is maybe something is hit uh, in the fan that makes them click. I'm not aware of any other mechanical part in the M1. So, yeah, yeah, Nigel. Yeah, I was going to say which M1 Mac is it? If it's your, if it's an Air, then there's a real problem because there's nothing particularly that moves in there. If it's uh, something with a fan, there's something wrong with a fan. Good, Peter.
thing. And that's why I, is it a click or is it a tick? And I know that sounds like a, a thing, but it is a switching power supply. And if the switching power supply is starting to go south, they can make rapid ticks. You go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, fan. Yeah, and, and what I will say is that if it if uh, you're in warranty and something goes if something isn't working on your computer, take it in. Like any like piece of electronics, if something is making a noise, especially if you can reproduce it, take it in immediately because uh, you 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 know whatever it is, once it's out of warranty, you won't be able to get it fixed. So don't put up with things that aren't working. Um, in, in general, this is also a good argument to keep most of your data on an external drive. What really keeps people from taking their computer and is there all their stuff is in there. And um, it either, you know, they're either protecting it or they just don't want to take it off or they don't want to, you know, put it at risk. So having external drives and having most of your stuff there where it's just your apps that could be reinstalled on your computer is a really good, good approach. And in general, up until the the most new, the studio, I was always like, get the smallest drive you can get for each each computer and then just keep everything outside. Um, I, I have two things. One is that I found that 250 gigs is pretty low. I got that for some of my computers and some of my little Mac minis. Um, and it's, a, it's pretty low if you're gonna do any, it's just, just installing uh, logic and all the samples is like 100 gigs. <laughs> so so, so it's, it, it, it doesn't take very much to fill it up. So 250 is probably too low and the studio hard drive or the SS or NVMe that's in there is five gigs per second. You can't get to, you can't, you can't find an external system that will do that without taking up all of your Thunderbolt in the back. And there is a system that does it. Someone here sent, sent that to me, but, but it takes up all, all the uh, Thunderbolts. Go ahead, Grant. Yeah, I just add about the um, under, under warranty, particularly Apple products, it's totally worth going to an Apple store, um, doing a genius appo appointment, whether it's in the war under warranty or not. Mm -hmm. You know, I took I took my AirPods Pro in um, recently, and they were they were out of warranty, and um, they were clicking and whatever. And they they took a quick look at it, and they said, "Oh, we ha we have to do a, an audio test on it. You know, it'll take twenty minutes or so." But I've already looked at the serial number. We think that it's a, it's in a batch that we, that we had problems. And so we'll probably detect that problem and we'll just give you new ones. That's exactly what happened. It was, yeah. you know, well out of the warranty. Um, and then they said, here you go. And now you've got another two years warranty on these yeah. new ones. Um, you never know on those serial numbers. I had that with, with laptops, with batteries. You didn't, I just didn't pick up that they had a recall on it or something. And, and uh, you go in, you know, years later, the worst, the worst that happens is they say, there's nothing really we can do. It'll cost you, you know, twelve hundred dollars to fix it, or you can buy a new one for a thousand, or you know, whatever it is. Um, and but sometimes they, you know, give you some offer. But right. definitely going to the Apple Store is the way. Going to a third party, um, you know, there's there's less that they can do, and they're thinking about how they get their money back as well. So Apple Apple Air is on the side. I mean, they're they're given an incredible amount of leeway to replace your product. You know, like you, you you generally you have you have better chance, and that's one of the reasons to buy Apple. And with Apple Care and all the other things, is just that they really are that you know they just want they're looking at their consumer from a lifetime perspective. Like like literally, they're, they're looking at it. You're going to buy a lifetime of of materials. You're going to keep on buying things from them, and part of that is that trust that it's, it's going to be there. And and uh, and they let you know that. And again, they they keep tracking. The one thing that I can tell you is that. If you have a, uh, a 2005 BMW, even four years after you don't have it, you'll still get emails about the, <laughs> the airbags. Evidently, there must be something really bad. <laughs> I was just thinking about when you're talking about recalls. I get it like I, mean, I get it, I get something like every two weeks uh, about my airbags, and um, I haven't owned the car for four years. I keep on sending back to the way. Not there. I'm my thinking. best replacement uh, story was was with an iPhone four. I took it into an Apple store, um, and I smashed the screen nine months after I bought it. Right. And they and they gave it's, me a new one. They're like this screen. Like, this screen was defective. <laughs> like, those, I think it, it yeah, broke when you those dropped long, it. Those days are long gone now. Yeah. The funny thing about that one was that was in Melbourne, and I and I was sitting next to a guy who was a tech blogger, and we both got our phones replaced that day. Like a a year later, I'm in California, and I had another need to go to the the genius. Went there, showed my phone, and he said, "Oh, this is." The text blogger, the tech blogger's phone. So when 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 they came and replaced them, they swapped them over, and I ended up I didn't even realize, but in their system it was saying this other guy's name, oh. and 
It was a wacky experience, but once again, totally global. It made no difference that I had bought it in Australia and was now trying to fix it in California. It's another reason to buy Apple too, right? I did. I had a family member, uh, I I won't call them out, but they they dropped their iPhone on the way out of the store. Um, They cracked it. They just gave a new one. (laughs) So anyway, go John. (laughs) But it was, that's that's about as, you know, just, so anyway, go John. I just wanted to give a quick update while um, we were giving Sage advice. Paul figured out the problem. It was his wife next door. So problem solved. Good job, everyone. (laughs) Okay. All right. Next question. Chad in Virginia wants to know, what is a good Zoom Teams multiple mic solution, wireless or wired for large conference rooms and multiple tables? Go ahead, Mark. So if you contact the DVE store, they can connect you with the Sennheiser solution of a ceiling array microphone that has worked wonders in our glass conference room. Yeah, and, and the, the one that I have the most experience with is the Microflexes, the Sure Microflexes, these are the competition to that. So the Sennheiser one I haven't used. Uh, the Sure one we've used a lot, and um, it has, it. the cool thing about the Sure is that it, it, it the receiver is Dante. It's, you know, a web page that you open up to, to manage all the things that need to be managed. And there's lots of different mic systems. There's labs, there's, you know, there's transmitters for labs, there is um, little, you know, desk mounted ones, there's surface ones, there's handhelds and all of these, you just put them in the charger, hit a button and it just sets them all up as one through eight, you know, or whatever you want or, you know, and, and it, and it just does the thing And it, it. So for corporate, it's super efficient. Go ahead, Grant. I, I, I know you're probably expecting this sort of answer as well, but that is don't use the conference and the conference room, you know, like I, I, I do these meetings now where you have, um, you know, half the people are at home like this, great setups, and then you've got five or six people sitting around a massive table. They sound terrible. They look terrible. It's just a bad experience. And I'm like, I would far rather them all be in their cubicle or their office looking like this, where we have full control and we can, everyone's the same. There's, there's something that goes on um, cognitively about how you interact with people when it's different. And so when you can get everyone on the same the same level, same playing field, it makes such a big difference. And I think it's one of the big reasons that Office Hours works so amazingly is because we've we've locked it down. We 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 all look, you know, the 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 same in our in our setups. We sound great and it just works really well and we can do it for hours and hours and hours. We could not do this if we had half of the panelists sitting around a conference table. Yeah, I will admit that as soon as you have one person that's not there, my recommendation is always going to be that you should um, put, I, I sit in meetings or I'm the person in Zoom and there's like 12 people in the room. And while the audio is okay, I really am out on the outside, you know, of, of the whole thing. And you just kind of, you know, it's, it's a really, a, even if the video and audio are relatively good, you're kind of just on this outside area. What we really noticed was there's a huge investment in the conference rooms themselves. As soon as the executives during COVID were <laughs> logging into them from the outside, they were like, this is horrible. I can't hear anyone. When did this happen? And we're like, when you built it, <laughs> that's when it happened. <laughs> like it was, it's been, and, and they've been here, like, we've been here for 12 years. Yeah. 12 years of bad meetings and everyone's sitting there trying to not understand what anybody's saying. Go ahead, Mark. Uh, so first of all, the Sennheiser is a, uh, the mic that I was talking about is a Dante enabled mic. Oh, that's nice. And uh, so you can control it all through Dante and hook it to Dante speakers and such. But uh, to speak to Grant's situ- uh, comments on, you know, everybody being on Zoom versus a conference room, I agree. But I will say there are cases where we have an open air design studio and there are multiple Zoom calls going on for different projects. You, you run into the situation where people can overhear other projects that you might have an NDA on. So that gets to be a problem. And so if you can put everybody in, you know, on those projects where you have NDAs into one room that's quiet and you don't have the overflow commentary, well, it helps. It's some not companies, as good as Zoom. So some of the companies in the South Bay who have large open office uh, architectures and now have as much as 30% to half of their employees not coming back to ever coming back to the office um, are building these booths that are um, designed to be inside of whether it's Zoom or Hangouts or Meet or whatever it is um, that are, they're soundproofed. They're, they're basically floating the rooms 
Um, they're, they're, they look pretty. They've got a nice background. They've got a little PTZ. They, and they, they're building these, these things out. Some of them are really cool. Like they have telestrators and they have, um, you know, things and little whiteboards and they're building them out because I think that a lot of them are dipping their toe into, let's figure this out because we may have to convert you know, large portions of what we're doing so that folks that are in the room can jump into those. And so that when you, and I got to say, if you're in a meeting with someone that's in one of those booths, it, it, it is at least as good as what we're doing here. I mean, these are, I will say the depth of field isn't as nice, but it's got, it's got all the features that I have at home, you know, but it's all kind of like hardware, you know, piece of hardware that you just push the buttons. I want to go to, you know, there's like a computer, I want to show my computer. There's like a little button that has a little button on the computer and you push the button, <laughs> you know, it's like it shows the computer. So, so the, um, uh, the, a lot of those things are, um, companies are, are definitely experimenting with it. And some of them are really, and, and some companies have been doing this for a long time. Like they've had these kind of remote um, things for a person to jump into a meeting for the last five, sometimes 10 years. Um, so, so it's not like they haven't done it, but there are, they're starting to ramp up because they've got a lot of space that's empty. And I don't think that they have the expectation of refilling that space. You know, there's some, some of them aren't, you know, they're not going to refill the space that they have. So they're, they're, they're building out these individual ones. And I got to tell you that when you're in the meetings, when everyone jumped into those and, and they're all a little different, they make them different so that they're not all the same. So the backgrounds are designed by some designer. So they all have like some, you kind of know where they're at. Um, but when you're in a meeting like that, it's so much nicer. Like if you're, if you're a person coming in from a virtual meeting, the audio is great and the lighting is great and the video is great. And they've got tons of tools to talk, you know, and draw on things and, 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 and discuss it. And it's, it's pretty cool, you know, and I think that that is, that's the future of conference rooms is just don't try to spend huge amounts of money on getting everyone around a table, just get them, give them the tools they need to talk to each other. Even if three, as soon as one person's coming in, just put them in these little booths and have three of them there. And, and, you know, that's the, and I think that that's the future of, you know, I'm in a lot of discussions about next year's conferences and you know, we're really getting into a point where if we're going to do a round table, it's all going to look like this. You know, like, and people are going to, some people are going to be on site, but we're going to give them their own little booths to join. You know, like they're literally going to not be on stage. They're just going to walk into a booth and be in this, you know, managed booth here. And then three other people will be from somewhere else in the world and everything else. And it'll look and sound great. Um, go ahead, Mark. One of our clients has these great rooms that you're describing where they have basically a small bar three or four stools. They face multiple screens. Everything's been acoustically treated. They all have their mics right there. And so they can talk with other consultants or other people in other offices that are in that same company, but it's all face to face yep. and no conference tables. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we've gotten into it. Like we just, what, what works, I still think works the best is everyone having their own little space. You know, there, there's no, you know, there's just nothing. They just go into it because otherwise they have some temptation to look sideways. And, you know, and it's, it's a subtle thing. It, it really isn't what people notice or whether they complain about it or not. It's how they feel. And that's the thing that I really learned is that you really, you know, they may not notice that they feel a little outside. Like we notice it because we know why that's the case, right? You know, if you talk to someone who's, um, if you talk to someone who, who run, you know, is an expert at running, <laughs> Uh, you know, like I, I, we, we did all this motion capture for a company that does, they, they work with like the German soccer team and people who are getting ready for, uh, co you know, combine and stuff like that. And so they're, they are, these are the masters of, of mechanics, right? And someone will talk about the fact that they can't throw as far as they need to throw, like a quarterback that wants to go into combine can't throw as far as they want and they'll work on the mechanics of their arm. Now that person's not complaining about it and they're already at a top level. But if they pull their elbow in by three inches, they're going to throw it another six feet. You know, like, you know, like, and, and so the thing is, is we pay very close attention to the mechanics of that. That person doesn't, a lot of people just don't know. They're just getting on a meeting. And so they don't know whether they're feeling, why they're feeling like a little outside or why that meeting, here's the, here's the worst part is, why does that meet, going to those meetings seem like a drag? Or why does that meeting, you know, why do you miss it when you're busy? You know, like, why do you, you know, you want it's how people are feeling. They're not complaining about the meeting. I mean, the meeting is what it is, but them not wanting to go or feeling like it's a, it's a tax on them is a, is a function of the meeting not working. And that can be the, how you organized it, the audio and video, how it's run, how it's all those things, but, but people not wanting to go to meetings or seeing them as a, as a, as a burden is a problem with the way it was designed. Go ahead, Grant. 
this is really interesting. I I just had a a, a virtual conference, you know, t- uh, two hundred and fifty attendees, um, and then we had six about six of the people got who were um, presenting got together in one location, and they were sharing that out, and that you know it was still one camera per person. But what happened is in some of the breaks and things, they were getting together. Um, they were standing around as a screen watching the sessions together. And what happened is they were referring to that and often doing things like this and, you know, laughing at someone and, oh, yeah, oh, someone just brought me this thing. And whenever they were referring to the fact that, oh, that break was great, that exercise was great, we had six of us all standing around the screen. It was all awesome. And what I realized sitting back is that they they separated themselves from everybody else's experience right. and 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 they didn't mean to do it and they were just saying about how great the the uh the event was but their experience was in person and they were excluding everyone else that was sitting by themselves at home um and so it made me think about like this digital first um idea that yes we can make everyone experience the same thing but the people that are putting on the show also need to sort of experience it through the eyes of individuals um, as attendees as well. It, it really started to mess with me as I saw it. I yeah. saw the, the impact that it was having on people that were by themselves. Yeah. yeah, absolutely, Nigel. Yeah, I think two thoughts crossed my mind. First of all is I used to use a telepresence room. It was built by HP. It was like four chairs with four chairs on the other side. These things cost a quarter of a million dollars to do. I know Cisco had one as well. I wonder what what it would cost to rebuild that using today's technology with brios and microphones. And that might be a a fun thing to to try to recreate that for conference rooms. Um, But but the other thought I wanted to quickly was to build them on Grant said, I think one of the hardest things for people, and I'm finding this challenge, is to reimagine in this world what events and sections of events look like. Because I, I can do an event, I could design an event for you in two minutes, as long as it was something like we used to run 10 years ago. You know, maintain, break out, you know, the structure is really easy for events people to do because we've been doing it for so long. I wonder whether there's a second hour or a conversation we could have is, what are the new modes and models of running parts of events that exploit this technology and how would you set up those sessions differently to achieve the benefits? Yeah, and, and definitely happy to talk about it. I'm working on one that is probably going to be... Uh, I think that I get to design it. <laughs> so, so, and you know, like the, uh, uh, you know, you never know until you actually do it, but, but the, you know, what we're looking at is there's a led wall. There'll be 300 people in the room. They'll all be there, you know, in their little tables that they, that they bought or whatever. Um, or, or they might be in circle. We'll find out. But the p- bottom line is the stage will be about 18 inches deep. <laughs> you know, like it's just, there's a little stage that sticks out and there'll be a big led wall every presentation that they see now they still get to have the hallway conversations they still get to have um they get to have the hallway conversations they get to have the um meeting with each other the meals they get to go to the expo they get to, there's a bunch of things that they get by being at that location so there's a reason to still come to the location but it's only going to be for two or three hundred people um the screen the keynotes someone's going to be in front of green screen They're going to be able to show tons of graphics. The graphics will be in front of them, behind them, all around them. It may be unreal. It may be, you know, like it's going to be very shock and awe for the keynotes. The round tables, though, will all be individual, you know, windows of people. Anybody talking in in one will have probably a bunch of booths in the back that they go into. Um, If they're so if they're there, they're in a each one of them has their own booth, but some of them almost every session will have people coming in over Zoom. So the thing is, is they'll, they'll come in over, you know, they'll come in remotely and they'll be in the session. So you'll see four people up there, but it won't be four people sitting on chairs. And my cameras will look better. My audio will be better. My lighting will be better. The Everything about that experience will be higher quality than what I can do on a stage. I mean, I, as someone who's shot a thousand shows on, on stages, like this will look better, sound better, you know, feel better in a lot of ways other than them not sitting there. And people will have to get used to the fact that, oh, they're not sitting right in front of me. But we have to remember that at 300, they might be sitting in front of you. At 3,000, you'd be looking at a screen anyway. 
you know, like you'd be looking up at some, it's at, at the return, you know, at the, at the delay uh, anyway. So you're not going to, I mean, so this is and now the other thing is, is we're going to work on having, you know, other venues. So venue, hopefully if Hosmux up for it in South Africa, a venue in, uh, in Adelaide, <laughs> you know, a, a, you know, venue, but, but a venues on a couple different continents, there'll be three or four venues on those continents. And you know what? they'll all sit there and have their dinners and do their thing and everything else. And they'll see it on a big screen, you know, in front of them. Uh, it might be an 80 inch screen for a smaller venue, it might be an LED wall for a larger venue. But the point is, is they'll all see it and their experience in those other venues while they're all together, you know, you know, because the folks that were in South Africa were never going to come to, San well, most of them could not come to San Jose for a day, <laughs> you know, like, you know, and most and the ones in Adelaide probably folks, you know, going for a day to, to San Jose is probably out of the question, you know? And so, so the thing is, is that these, these venues that are local, um, they're all gonna have the exact same experience as the ones that are in the room with 300 people, you know, and they're gonna have, you know, you know they, and we're gonna take them on, you know, we're, I'm designing the expo so that we can shoot it. So the expo is not designed for people, it's designed for people to walk through it and do everything, but I'm also designing all the booths specifically so that they're shootable you know, so that we can take the online audience out on a tour through it, you know, through it, like what we're researching right now on how to do it, NAB and IBC and, and Cinegear, but, but we're taking what we're learning there and turning it into how do we build the expo for us rather than how do we just go and cover the expo. And then, and then the thing is, is that we have all these people that are able to do that. Now, of course, we can stream this experience out so that people can, you know, watch it on, they can watch it on Zoom. They can, you know, they could be in Zoom webinar or events or, or whatever we choose to put them in, or they can be watching online, whatever we decide to, to put it out there, their experience is the same. You know, not, you know, they don't get to hang out with people, but if they can't get to somewhere, but we all are now, we all have a front row seat that looks very similar to everybody else's front row seat, you know? And, and the cool thing is, is that if you do it this way and you do it every year, the first year, two or three locations, but I can I could grow it out if if Mark wants to have uh, a have a bunch of architects in and have fifty people that he knows in his thing, and you know he can have a watch party, and that watch party will be first class citizen, not second class citizen, you know, and everything. So the thing is, is the ability to turn this into a giant event that is, you know, because you can see this one's going to be mostly about what we do, and so imagine like like you know guy you know, or B&H or other people putting watch parties in their, in their spaces so that people from their local community can all just come in and watch it. And again, again, with our knowledge, we can have, even have, if we wanted to, we can have them all using Makana, but we could also have people just stand up at a DVE store and go, I've got a question. And we just, <laughs> from, you know, like you, <laughs> you know, those things are all possible as far as it, but the, the key is, is you have to, it, you, you kind of have to commit to all of it to make it work. You know, like what we're having right now is people don't, they kind of, you know, they want to make the, the spaghetti, but they don't really want to use the eggs. And you're kind of like, well, that's, <laughs> that's how you make spaghetti. You know, like, you know, like, you know, the, it's, you know, like if you take the, if you take an ingredient out of it, it, it no longer is the thing. And so I think what we've had trouble with is getting people to commit to the whole, the whole recipe. They keep on wanting to take parts out of it or substitute parts of it or whatever. And they're like, well, it's not very good. And I'm like, well, that's not the recipe. You know, so so the thing is, is that, uh, so I think we're gonna get the opportunity to do something like that soon. We'll probably engage a lot of you to play along. And, um, but I think that it, uh, it uh, and I think that we can, I, I think that people will start to understand it when they see the whole thing. You know, I've been able to do pieces of this and we've been able to do private ones, hopefully you know, the idea is to do a public one, people can see that. But I think that's the, and we can talk more about show design or digital first show designs in the next couple of weeks. We'll put that into the second hours um, because I think that thinking through that, but that's my thought process right now is really building an event that is great if you're there. Like it's, it's gotta be great when you come, but is also can easily replicate. You know, if those, if the people in the expo wanted to be in four of the cities, they could do that. You know, like, and, and they could just, then there's a little mini expo in New York and a mini expo in LA and a really big one here in San Francisco or whatever. And so they can, you know, and, and that's just part of their sponsorship package. And if you limit, cause I don't want their, I don't want the booth to be really big or really loud because I'm shooting, you know? So, you know, I want the booth to be right now, the thought process is they go at like an angle like this and they're pretty thick walled, but then this side. So, you, you know, you see like, this is a booth and this is a booth. And these are open walls like that, because when I shoot, I want to be able to, it's, I want to have more open coverage. And the idea is you just give them a, a, 
a model. It's not like they're going to come in, they get a table and a model and this is all built for them and it's built for our shooting and it's built for the audio and it's built for the lighting. Like all of that's kind of built into the system. They just bring their tape, they bring the stuff they want to put on the table, <laughs> that's, you know, and, and you put carpet on the back because it cuts down on the audio, but it also means all you need is Velcro. You just put Velcro on the back of the posters you want to put up and you just put them up. You don't have to have any things that you pull up. You don't have to have anything else. You know, we just give you the dimensions and you can just use Velcro and put everything up. You put the things on the, on the floor. Everything else is all done for you. Like you don't have to, and, and you know, it's funny is, is that we think of that as very odd because we're used to it here in a kind of a pre-built stall is very common in other parts of the world. Like I, there's definitely lots of conferences I go to that those pre-built stalls are all done that way. This one is a little bit better because the problem with those pre-built stalls, you can't, you can't shoot in them because they're, they're so yucky. <laughs> so, so I don't want word, I guess it's a technical term for it, but, but, um, but we can build those out. So anyway, that's the, that's kind of what I think might be possible and we'll, we're pretty close to being able to prove it. Uh, next question. So that's, that's okay. what microphone you should get. What microphone? No, so that so that the answer to the question yeah, yeah, exactly. was about what microphone to get for the conference. <laughs> Saturday. So there you go. That's the it, answer. It's Saturday, and we have less than we have a we have a lower number of questions uh, than than the thing. So we'll run on a little bit. If, you, if for producers, if you if you stack on lots of questions, we move faster. But if you don't stack them on, we eh, I got time to answer this question a little bit. We we'll go a little rat hole. Uh, next question. I'm looking for a rock solid video player for use in a retail environment. Please, uh, I prefer a non PC solution. And Mitchell Hill he just doesn't like PCs. I don't understand. Anyway, go ahead, uh, Tom. Well, you said a retail solution, and so uh, I thought about something a little off offbeat. I put in a bright sign device in a senior center. And it can simultaneously play back both local network and streaming sources. You can put up menus, do a number of different things uh, through Ethernet. You can do your editing. You can do your scheduling. Uh, this allows you to not only update the device, but change the material that you're showing depending on the time of day. Uh, it's a pretty versatile device. Starts at about $300 and goes up depending on what features you want. Can we, I go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, that's a good suggestion, Tom. I, I've used the Alcorn McBride in the past. Uh, it's sort of a, a brick uh, in, in a way it works and the way it's, uh, it continues to work years and years later. But uh, you put that up there. There you are, Dennis. That's the uh, device. They make stuff for Disney and people like that. But I'm always looking for something else that I can install and not have to worry about it ever again. Good, Grant. Yeah, just a plus one on the bright sign. Um, so I have one of those. I I use it. Uh, I actually use it in productions because I can I throw it in and it has a timer on it, things like that. And so yes, the um, the online um, management of it is amazing because you can simply dial into a scheduler wherever you are, change the schedule, upload media, all of that. Um, or once you lose your subscription, if you don't have a subscription anymore, it actually does work standalone as well, which is the state that it's in for me at the moment. Um, and it just launches a, a web browser um, and uh, and full screen um, browser and it works great. So those devices are, are rock solid. And how much are the bright signs? Yeah, like well, they started at 295. Yeah. Wow, and that's really cool. Go on up. That's slick. Yeah, and the Alcorn McBride is probably around two, three thousand dollars. Yeah. yeah, and the it's one we use, sign dot biz. Right, right, right. Yeah, and, and the, yeah, the one that we've used for this kind of thing for shows, and not necessarily for you know, if you're looking for a Mac solution, is on the air video from Softron because it's got lots of scheduling and stuff. It's probably way more than you need for for what you're doing. Um, but it's, uh, and it runs. I mean, we run test signals out of our facility with Softron that run for. I, I haven't tried it for years, but definitely for months, you know, where they're just, you know, doing, going through cycles and we can, and for us, it has a lot of, of other tools, which you know, it has 10 bit and, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, can put out as many channels as we want and so on and so forth. Um, next question. Andy Carluccio from San Francisco, California. What do you think of guest mode for Zoom apps? Go ahead, Grant. Yeah, so there's just a little bit of backstory. Um, the not not the last uh, Zoomtopia, but the one before that, when they announced what they called Zaps back then, um, which uh, was a infringement on um, Zapier. Uh, 
Um, they, uh, what they were saying is, you know, he, here you can have a window pane, <clears throat> excuse me, a window pane in Zoom that you could control. So you could bring a whole bunch of kind of web data back into it and make some interactivity and it, and it gives the ability to, to interact with Zoom. Um, a, a, a gaping problem in that was that you have to install it. Every user has to install it which means every user had to enable it in their admin first, enable um, Zoom apps, and then enable the app, and then authorize the app, and then tie it back into, you know, the group that you're doing. And so then fast forward to this, uh, the the Zoomtopia that went last, I asked the team um, about that. They were, they were saying, oh, you can get your, your grandparents to come and play a game in Zoom. And I was like, yeah, but how do you do that when you need, you need grandpa to log into to Zoom admin, enable Zoom apps, then enable the game app, then authorize it, make sure you're logged into Zoom before you join that app, before you join the meeting, and then, and then enable it again. Anyway, it's ridiculous that it was, you know, seven steps. So all of that to say, then they talked about guest mode. Guest mode um, is already something that was was in Zoom. We experience guest mode all the time, which is you don't have to have um, a Zoom account to join Zoom um, if you're allowing people just to join the Zoom. They don't have to be authenticated or be registered. Um, you can just allow anyone to join Zoom. And now they're joining that together to say the host enables the Zoom app and then because it's enabled in the meeting, that then anyone who joins as a guest will have that app pop up and away it goes. That's what it is in theory and that's what we're trying to explore because we're trying to get Obvio to sit inside of a Zoom app, but we can't have anything, anything, anything to authenticate or require you to be logged into Zoom or any of that. It needs to just work. And so it's, it's still in the infancy but it sounds like that's the direction that it's all going. Yeah, good, John. Yeah, I think it's important, especially in, in two main use cases I see every day at work. And the first is every company has their own pet video conferencing software, whether it's Teams or Zoom or BlueJeans or WebEx. Um, you get an invite, then you have to install something, then it's just sitting on your computer sending you alerts. I hate WebEx for that. What the guest mode allows people to do is send a single link and be logged into a meeting, which... In corporations, there's a lot of meetings managed by very smart technical people, including the IT department, where you spend the first 10 minutes of the meeting just trying to get logged in or sharing a screen. Oh my gosh. And this kind of feature can help someone who's not used to Zoom quickly get into a Zoom meeting, which yeah. sounds simple, um, but it's a lot more complicated than it sounds. Onboarding is such a big deal. You know, yeah. and it's it's something we struggle with even with Makana. Like, how do you set this all up and how do you make it work? And how does someone not end up in a black hole? And how does someone get in that doesn't know, you know, how this actually works? And and so it is a, um, you know, I think it's a huge step forward and it can, it can be kind of state aware. So when you come in and go, oh, you're a panelist, I'm gonna show you certain things within the app that are looking, you know, so for instance, we we're hoping to have Makana work this way where it, you go in and it goes, oh, you're a panelist, here's the panelist view. Oh, you're a, you're a producer, here's the producer view. You know, like, and, and we, can, we can change those based on, you know, how we've set that up for you. So, so that's the, it's pretty exciting. So, um, so we'll, we'll, see how, uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, next question. Craig Kadoki in Toronto, uh, ca uh, Canada. Yesterday's major internet outage across Canada that took out not only internet, ResCom, but also cells, banking, and 911. What will it take to make the powers that be treat this as a utility instead of a commodity and ensure higher redundancy? So if someone is California, when you say a utility will have higher redundancy. In Northern <laughs> California, we, we laugh. <laughs> it's so cute. Uh, anyway, go ahead, Serge. I think there's a lot of discussion to go around that because we saw Facebook a few months ago we saw multiple big companies. It's not just the redundancy. It's sometimes the, the example, the 911 service. I'm surprised that they didn't have a disaster recovery already planned, already available. Uh, just have to switch it on and make it happen. Uh, it doesn't make any sense because redundancy could be 
not working if the problem is that the router and the BGP and things like that. So it's it's really, really strange what happened yesterday. But it's do we know more, what was the basis of it? We don't know exactly, but what uh, what we gather is probably a maintenance that went wrong because the problem mm -hmm. occurred during the night. Uh, like I, I think it starts 4 a.m. Eastern time. Especially so, when, especially when they start at the top of an hour, like right, right at four. I don't know if it was four a.m., but when they when things four, start right yeah. at the top of an hour, you're like, well, somebody just p pushed a pack. during the night. Yeah, yeah. it's <laughs> it's probably a maintenance that went wrong. Yeah. But it, yeah. The the okay. worst case, the worst thing is seeing that the nine one one service was not working, seeing that uh, debit card were not working, seeing other yeah. services that were just dead. So these service just realize that they are dependent of one provider. It doesn't, in my mind, it's, it's a wrong setup at first. Yeah. And, and I think that the good news is, is that when something happens like this, that isn't catastrophic, I mean, it's very inconvenient and, and everything else, but not generally catastrophic. Hopefully people start to like, there's a bunch of meetings you know, about like, how do we not have this ever happen again kind of thing. I know that in other companies, I mean, this was a pretty catastrophic thing to have happen. But, um, you know, I was watching, I don't know if, if everyone else was watching, there was a lot of solar activity going on, uh, on in the, the sun was really busy over the last two weeks. And, um, you know, there is a, when we talk about like, how bad things can get, they can get a lot worse. You know, like, you know, like, so, so, um, and when, when you start seeing them like, Hey, there's a really large sunspot pointed right at the earth, or there might be a coronal mass ejection, or there's a coronal, you know, opening, or there's a, you know, solar, like those are not minor things. You have to remember that the, 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 um, uh, in the Carrington event in the 1850s, they saw the Aurora Borealis in Cuba, like, you know, at the, uh, the telegraph offices caught fire that was telegraph offices <laughs> like, just be clear like this is before they had a lot of electronics so like you know when we think about like how bad things can go when they go out um you know we're not you know there's there's our government at least the united states government spends a lot of money thinking about that problem um go ahead peter i was about to say one of the one comment i'll make is this is a case where technology is outpaced regulation the, um, if you think about it, for those of us who are old enough, the regular old twisted pair of landline had to provide a dial tone within 30 seconds by law right. to support the uh, emergency phone call service. That, has, that law has gone away. Because the, because the, the, the service provider is like, oh, we can't do that anymore. It's not, you can't do that. You can't do it anymore. I mean, if, I, you know, they can't do it anymore. And you're right. We go through, I mean... They go through great pains. One net, as an example, in the U.S. is is both major providers to provide backup from each other, which is the, the which is the emergency services cellular right. network. But banking and everything else is still, you know, pick your provider and hope they know what they're doing. Well, and and I find that I as just just as an uh, anecdotal, I find that my every year my phone it works less and less like a phone. Like my calls get worse every. My calls were never better than when we before we started going to three G. You know, like like it's uh, it's it's um, you know everything. Every step forward after that is just worse reception. Go ahead, Craig. And we have to re we always have to remember what was DARP DARPANET Internet created for? Right, redundancy. Yeah. Redundancy. Yeah. yeah, Craig. Yeah, that was going to be one of my points. Is exactly that is is uh, it was supposed to be redundant. There's supposed to be backups and and alternate pathways. Um, what it looks like happened was was probably some sort of a, a system update on Roger's network, uh, and mm -hmm. it did actually take out different parts of the service uh, in stages. <clears throat> Pardon me, but um, yeah, it's it, there are laws here as far as the nine one one service goes, and that's going to be something that's going to be uh, they're going to have to be held accountable for. But um, it's it is getting to be uh, a bit ridiculous that there isn't uh, some sort of overall plan to keep systems going. It's, it's I, not just people watching YouTube, it, it's serious stuff. And I think that, you know, Canada is uh, more exemplified than, than in the United States where Canada is extremely vertical. Like there's, there's very little redundancy in Canada, in, in Canadian services. 
and it's why Canadians pay so much money for what they get is because it's it's all locked up in a, in a uh, oligarchy. <laughs> you know, so it's you know of like two provide. It's like Rogers and somebody else, right? I mean, it's well, like yeah, Rogers and Bell. And Bell. And, so there's two providers. They are not particularly competitive with each other. They are charging. I mean, it, I when I go up to Canada, I'm like, this is highway robbery. You know, like you know, and and that's from coming from someone in the United States where it really is highway robbery as well. You know, and so like when you go to countries where the government has said this has to be much closer to utility, um, things get, you know, you get a lot more speed for a lot less money and a lot more stability and so on and so forth. And um, I think in the United States, the thing that we have to keep on coming back to, and I'm, I'm going to try to bring, a friend of mine owns an ISP, a small ISP, and I think we're going to bring him on for a second hour just to talk about the trials and tribulations of uh, internet service. <laughs> so, because I think that, you know, for, when I talk to him, the big thing is poll access, you know, just being able to, put up a new services, there's so many uh, things that stop that. And that's putting us all at risk. Go ahead, Greg. I was just going to add to that. Uh, at that point, though, aren't they still piggybacking off of uh, one of the majors? They've got direct access. No, poll access a lot means providers. they can run their poll access. I mean, they, they have to run some of that backbone to different things. But uh, but I think that, you know, a lot of times poll access is just getting their own cables on those polls. You know, that, like that's what, they're, that's what they're trying to do is they're trying yeah, to run their own fiber. Because we've got lots of, of smaller independent providers that, you know, just buy services. Right. But there's, but, the, but, but there are some that are running their own fiber out. They're running their own pieces out. Yeah. But the problem in the United States is they get cut off. And I think that, I, I think we are going to end up with the, the, the drumbeat, in, at least in the United States, of, of turning cable. Cable has been really good at donating enough money to representatives to keep them from, uh, doing the obvious, which is to turn them into a utility and say that everybody has to have fiber. Everybody has to have, you know, and so far they've been able to spend enough money to keep that from happening, but it won't happen forever because it keeps on becoming a problem. Uh, next question. Tony Mobley from Noonan, Georgia. I'm in training today. So that fact that the iPhone not working today is fine, but what do I get not working? Restarted Mac mini, A10 mini, and the iPhone still seeing black screen. Right, go ahead, Serge. I was not clear of exactly what is black, but I imagine he's trying to get his iPhone with HDMI to the ATM. I got sometimes a black issue and I just re weirdly just reversed the adapter and it started to working again. I have found that sometimes yeah, unplugging and plugging it back in, if you're using any cable that's not made by Apple, you may have a problem like it or any adapter. Um, I've definitely... Uh, had it go into states with third-party cables. Like I bought, a, I bought a bunch of little third-party cables that are doing the work for them because they were longer or they were whatever. And I was trying to get them to work and they worked once or twice or sometimes for a week. And then suddenly the, they just didn't interact with the phone anymore. So I don't know what cables you're using or what adapters. The only ones that I can guarantee work all the time. The, the unis have always worked for me, these little unis, or unis or unis, whatever they call them. Um, they, uh, they've worked reliably for me and then the, all the Apple stuff, but I have had enormous, I mean, gone through hundreds of dollars worth of third party lightning to HDMIs to get phones as part of a production system. And it's been a thing. Go ahead, Peter. I, I guess the way I would, I would emphasize what Sir says, even with Apple adapters, I have had to literally pull it out of the phone, twist it 180 degrees and stick it back into the phone. And then it works. I I haven't had it be 180. I've just had unplug it and plug it back in. I mean, I don't know if, if it if you have to turn it, but you have unplugged it and plugged it back in, and it and it didn't work. And then you flipped it. So weird. It, I, I, you know, you know. I, I used okay, to say IBM said. believes stands for I believe in magic. What, what what they said? Flip the. So Tony, do that and let us know tomorrow whether and that worked. That'll I think funny. something sometimes is just dirt on one side of the connector. Uh, then yeah. Reverse it make it work. Next question. And it's from Paul Valhus in Austin, Texas. What's the best way to manage Matterport scans through time to show changes in home furnishings, et cetera? No idea. Never done that. Like I, I've used Matterport a fair bit. Uh, I did get the new one. I haven't unboxed it yet. I told everybody we'd, I'd unbox it slowly on <laughs> some after hours. I haven't done it yet. I just haven't gotten to it. Um, but the, uh, I have, you know, usually when you're doing Matterport, Matterport is a, it, it basically is a controlled head. Um, now the, the original Matterport was using the little Microsoft, um, I can't think of the name of it, but the, the little cameras and it would 
actually digitize and shoot the background. And what's kind of cool is you can walk around a space and it uses, the 3D isn't very good, but it, it's good enough for it to know where it is. And so it, you can, it builds great little tours of a space um, that you can uh, tour around in. And so they, um, uh, so it's really good if you want to say, oh, this is what my apartment looks like or a house. What they're building these for is house tours, you know, so that someone can tour a house virtually and see if they like it. And, um, and so, and it's super easy to, the, the, the bigger one was easy to use, but it was $5,000. The new one here is with a one year subscription is like a couple hundred bucks. It's pretty good. And so, um, I haven't gotten to test it yet. I, 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 you know, sometimes I get things and <laughs> they're in the queue for a little while as I work on things, but, uh, probably in the next week or two, I'll, I'll, I'll do an unboxing and we'll, we'll play with it a little bit. Now, next question. Chad Lafarge, Columbia, Missouri. Aside from Countryman H6 and the DPA 4066, is there another trustworthy headset mic that won't break the bank? All right, go ahead, Craig. Um, as an early office hours uh, uh, purchase that I uh, found was the, uh, I don't know if this is going to show up, probably not too much, but it's the uh, it's the Polson headset mic with the dual ear. Um, mm -hmm. Cheap and cheerful, uh, definitely won't break the bank. You can buy a few of them to have uh, uh, backups and uh, still be well under budget of either the uh, the other two mentioned. Yeah, I, the the pol we we kind of circled around the pulse and uh, dual ears um, uh, for a fair bit. Pile also makes them. Those are like fifteen twenty bucks each. Um, so those are relatively inexpensive. Audio quality obviously is much higher on the H6 and the DPAs. Um, they also have a standard, most of them, I mean, they're easier to figure out. Like the DPA has a micro, you can get it with a micro dot, which means you can change it to from a TA4 or TA5 or a XLR or mini XLR. Those are all these little things that you can do with those um, that you can't necessarily do with the um, with the smaller ones that are, I mean, you can, just the adapters are a lot more complicated. Um, so. Uh, you know, the, the quality is dramatically different, in my opinion, between the between those the H6 slash 4066 in the Samson or the Samson Pulson piles, but they do work and they and they are um, uh, and we, we've used them for a lot of kits. We use them less now, mostly because we found more people over time were willing to put the mic in the frame. So we had a lot of people that didn't want to put a mic stand up that didn't want the mic in the frame didn't want you know they and it, and we didn't you know so that was like a big challenge for us as and it's part of why i keep my mic in the frame is to continue the culture of it's okay to put a mic in a frame uh, you know because i'm i'm you know people notice that the audio sounds really good and i said well it's because i have a mic and i'm pretty close to it and then people start you start, people start buying them and so on and so forth and so um now that that's happened we've moved more and more towards having a uh using the MB7s, um, you know, that's what we've kind of, in that way, because people don't mind having it there. So, uh, and Mitchell's showing his his mic that it's out of frame, but the main thing is, is that we can figure out a way to make our rooms out of frame. My thing is I have to send kits out to people um, and it has to be, you know, reasonably cost and and still sound good. And, and I'm looking for lots of off axis rejection because usually their rooms are stink. Um, next question. Tennis champion Walker from Mansfield, UK. What does the panel think of Talalik's traversal appearing in the middle of the smart gallery? I think it's okay. I, I, uh, now that we're using this in the middle, like I was a little like, I don't like the gallery being <laughs> around the corners. I, I literally just sent something to JJ just going, that's weird. Uh, I would rather just cut to it, to be honest. I mean, I'd rather just cut to the traversal. The Talalik tra traversal is, if you're listening, is, jumping to each location um, in, in uh, Google Earth to show where, where the question's coming from or who's answering it. Uh, I, I think I'd, for me, I think I would rather have it be um, full screen. Go ahead, John. I think it looks nice. Um, it does make everything, continues to make everything look very blue. One time that I, I've, I've been watching it where I've been confused is if it's going just over just land, it's hard for me to tell, have a sense of geography. And sometimes mm -hmm. you see the city names and sometimes not. And that's a little bit confusing to me personally. Yeah. Go ahead, Mitchell. Um, I, I agree with Alex. Uh, the, the, the thing of it is, if it's moving and it has motion to it, there's no reason to have any of the uh, gallery view on there because you're going to focus on the motion. So you might Good as well just Mark. have it all there. Go ahead, Mark. Yeah, I'm wondering if it wouldn't be better just to have a static map that had a red light go on from where the question was asked and then maybe another color light pop up think, from where the question is being answered. 
I think finding it would be is fun. I think I, I really like the traversal. I think that the main thing though is that also, it's also not sustainable. Like when we uh, push hard, we're not pushing very hard to bring in panelists. When we push a little harder to expand the panel and so on and so forth, you're gonna end up with a lot of fuller panels. And so being able to put something, like this is not a model that works if we are getting 12 to 16 people every day. So, so I think that it's probably, I would probably keep on working on it as more of a full screen. I do wish, and I don't know whether we have the option in Google Earth, is to show more text. You know, like it, and to, to the point that was just made, I don't, I can't orient myself very often to where I'm looking at because there's just not, like it would just great if large cities were in text or something, I think that that would be easier. I do think that Google Earth is the right way to go. We, we've been talking a little bit about using geometry like a, a, a planet or something like that or a, a, a globe or whatever. The problem is, is that the level of detail in the map would have to be really big to match what we're getting with Google Earth if we can get the the names up there. So that's the thing. It might make sense to do the geometry and not get closer, but we have to get, we just have to have see more names displayed so we understand what we're looking at. Um, that's the only problem I have with the traversal. I think it's cool and I would love to see more of it. Um, next question. Next question from Craig Kadoki in Toronto, Canada. What do you think of Apple's newly announced lockdown mode? Serge? I think it's great. I really lo uh, love the idea of having Asher's uh, a better security in my Apple device, and especially on my phone, because this device can have access to my password, can have access to my banking account, can have access to my business password, my business 2FA. It's so important for me, and as a security, not a security expert, but an IT director, to have good security on my phone. And if I have to log down a little bit, I don't mind that. Yeah, it's it pretty restrictive. So I don't think the average person will use it. It's really designed for someone like Serge, who's a is an IT you know director, you know, who's really accountable for a lot of those things. What it's really designed for is to make sure that um, uh, I can't think of the Israeli company right now, but but um, make sure that they can't get in. Like that's I mean, literally, it is. We, the Apple built the whole thing so that companies like the Israeli surveillance company uh, that for some reason is slipping my mind at the moment, um, but uh, that it can't, um, if you turn on, if you're a press person in the press, if you are a politician, if you are a, you know, someone who thinks that you're, you may be a target of state actors or of that it is, um, you can turn that on. I have a feeling that the intelligence agency is not going to be our intelligence agency is and the five eyes <laughs> are not going to be super excited about the fact that Apple just built something that shuts them out. Like, you know, like it's, it's a, uh, you know, this is, you'll notice that our intelligence agencies aren't the ones using the Israeli surveillance. It's like, they're, you know, like they, they may already be able to do that. So, so anyway, so the, um, uh, so the fact that Apple's building something that cuts them out, because the, the argument will be that it's not just people who, uh, the argument, the, the, the challenge that Apple will have is that it, it, it's not just useful for people that are uh, being um, surveilled like journalists and politicians. It's also good for drug dealers and you know other things like that that wanna make sure that, that state agencies can't get in. So, so that's, that's gonna be the next drama that we see with it. I think it's a great idea. I think Apple should do it. I think that, that whatever the risks are, they don't, they don't outweigh the, you know, we need to be always able to um, be able to protect ourselves. And those phones are extensions of ourselves at this point. Um, they oftentimes know more about us than we do. <laughs> so, so we have to, uh, I think that it's important, but I think that that'll be the next argument that you'll probably see is uh, intelligence agencies. I mean, we have to remember that a big reason that governments are talking about breaking up uh, what they call a, a monopoly is really driven from intelligence. You know that that they they need that to break up quickly because they can't this it puts they they can't see what they want to see. Uh, next question from Eric Nathan in Bellingham, Washington. If you only had two microphones you could use forever, which ones would you choose and why? Go ahead, Tom. Well, today I'm using a Heil Pure 40, and I like it. I'd always stay with it, but you always remember your first love, <laughs> and that goes back to the. Uh, working at KRFM Radio in the 60s, we had the Neumann U67. It's still available, $7,500 at Sweetwater. Uh, Mitchell? 
Um, I The one I've used forever it happens to be my U87, which is sitting behind me. And yes, it does have a foam windscreen on it, Mickey. I'll take that off there after the show. Um, I've had that since 1978, one of my first purchases. And what's interesting is a voiceover artist, you develop a relationship with the microphone. So this is the why part. Um, and I know how to use that mic. I know how to work the proximity on it. I know how it works on my voice. I know how to set the EQ up on it. Um, and it works really good. Or well, excuse me. Uh, the other the other mic I use happens to be the one that uh, I'm using right now uh, on Zoom, the uh, AKG 414. And it does have a foam uh, windscreen on it because um, I don't want to have a big circular thing in front of me. And I... I uh, different from Alex, I don't want the uh, the microphone to be seen in the shot because I just want my voice to be concentrated on. So U87 and AKG414 are my two faves. Grant? Uh, so my first love is uh, was a SM58 um, that I bought from my high school music teacher. Um, and I still have it and still use it. Um, and it's just, it, it is, it's a rock solid, it, you know, it just always works, works great for singing, works great for, for, for talking. It's just a great mic. Um, and then the other mic that I use regularly and wish I had it here, um, is the, uh, the Neumann TLM 103. Um, and so I've used that, um, quite a lot on, um, in recording. Um, and I've also, uh, we have a pair of them, a matched pair, um, and so we use them, um, we've used them for a recording and then I've used them, um, in live sound as well. Um, to, they're not generally used for live sound, um, but they can be, um, I've used them, um, in a, an acapella group, um, standing around a pair of them and it sounded amazing. So, um, I guess I would stretch and say, um, I would have two of one, um, and, uh, and, and the, and the 58. Yeah. And, and I would, uh, I would say that, uh, TLM 102 or 103. I mean, this is a 102 that you're listening to me through. And it's just a great, from a size perspective, I'd probably get, if, if I could only have one, I'd probably have the TLM 103 as far as, far as the 102. Uh, but they're both about the same form factor um, and uh, close to the same sound. I do think that the, the TLM 103 is a little richer than the, two, it's just twice as much money, which is why I have a 102. Um, anyway, so, uh, and the, um, and the SM58 as like kind of an all-purpose needs to get out. So I would definitely agree with Grant on that. If I had one more, I'd probably get a DPA 4066. That would kind of cover the, these are the three things that I want to do. I want to be able to hold it and go outside. I want a he uh, headset and I want a, one that's more of a studio mic. Um, next question. Next question in from Eric Nathan in Bellingham, Washington. How much audio compression is too much for the spoken word voiceover? <laughs> go ahead, Mitchell. Uh, I think uh, it's too much when you can hear it working. Um, I know that it's sort of like a subjective answer, but um, it's there mainly as a technical, um, not a brick wall necessarily, but a safeguard uh, to keep you from hitting digital zeros. So uh, the usual setting, um, 3 dB of compression is okay. You don't really hear it. it just, well, in, yeah, and, and, and I would say that... that uh, uh, a limiter is really to keep us protected from that, um, you know, typically. I mean, I think that the, the compressor is really pulling everybody together um, or pulling a person who has might have a lot of dynamic range together. I find that when I, uh, and, and I wouldn't say dB, what I would probably say is the ratio of the compression. So three to one, four to one, uh, two to one. I don't recommend anything over three to one. And I oftentimes don't compress very much anymore. Uh, I've kind of fallen into the the um, NPR kind of not, you know, having the dynamic range there, not a lot of uh, not a lot of compression. So personally, I don't go much over uh, two to one at this point. If I if I do any compression at all, um, and uh, where you hear the compression working has a lot to do with the threshold. So the threshold is when will you start to work? You know, when will that um, compressor start to turn on if that compressor if if it's too high uh, you'll hear it breathing a lot you know and so and if it's too low you're, you're gonna so basically what happens is if you have let's say this is zero you might say oh my threshold is at negative 18. now if that it just depends on where the noise is the more i pull this down if i go down to negative 26 i'm basically scooping up 
the background and moving it into the foreground. So I have to be careful of where this this lies. If it's too high, I'll hear it breathing. You know, so if I set it up to negative twelve, I'll hear I'll hear the the stuff. It'll I'll hear it working. So that threshold really makes a big difference. Obviously, that that is accentuated by the. Um, it's accentuated by the the, um, the the ratio that you're using. Go yeah, ahead, Grant. The, the, main, the main difference that I have between using a compressor and a limiter, a limiter generally you don't hear. It's a brick wall that just sets that absolute maximum, and it's fast on the attack. Uh, a compressor is more if somebody was there adjusting the volume and keeping it consistent. So, you know, the, the question is about compression, and it, like I said, uh, if you want somebody to do a gain writing to make sure your voice level is consistent, uh, a compressor with like a three to one will do the same thing if somebody were actually sitting there with the volume and adjusting it. I'll argue it does something different, but but anyway, it's it's a, it's a, that, that we can keep on discussing that. Go ahead, Grant. Yeah, I would just I just add that I I think about um, the the visual element of compression. It's one of those things where actually seeing when it's kicking in and out is really helpful. And so if it's constantly hitting it in, if it's constantly coming in, then um, it's too much. You know, you can argue that it's too much. Um, the other thing is that when it is, you'll, you'll often hear um, your noise floor um, going up and down. It's the breathing that Alex is talking about. You can kind of hear it going up and down um, because if, the, if it's on too much and your signal is constantly hitting the compression, then what's happening is that it's um, when it turns off, it's going to lift up again. And then, you know, so you're constantly hearing it going up and down, up and down. And yeah. so actually visually seeing when it's kicking in is really helpful. And then threshold and and uh, and the amount that it's doing the ratio is really helpful. So it's just playing around with it. And that's where actually recording, um, uh, playing around with it in post is really helpful. Um, and then learning what you'll do um as you're going in, depending on how you're recording, but and and just and, and again, gentle is is I think the <laughs> it's super easy to get into this thing. Like let's turn the compression way up, and it makes it less listenable. Like again, to go back to the NPR example, it's not that NPR doesn't add any compression; it's that it doesn't add very much, and it does it very very gently. Um, and so it, it it just kind of pulls things together. You can hear that they're using some compressor because you can hear their breaths really loud, and so that that's a that's a usually a good sign that they're pulling they're pulling that up um, in into that into that area. So. I've just, that, there's a red pill, by the way. If, if you listen to NPR, you hear a lot of breaths um, and you'll never now not be able to unhear it. Sorry about that. Next question. Next question from TJ Asher in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Recommend a USB-C to HDMI converter for me to use with a Mac Studio. Go ahead, Peter. I, um, I use the, uh, the uh, JSOX uh, USB-C to HDMI cable. And I do that on a regular, um, I have that running from my Mac Pro to my three 4K screens. It does 4K at 60, 60 hertz. So, and it's backwards compatible to all the lower HDMI resolutions. Mm -hmm. And I also use it from my M1 into my uh, Blackmagic, from my M1 into my Blackmagic uh, capture card in my Mac Pro, and it works just fine. Go ahead, Mark. So if you want an adapter, the Apple adapter, of course, is probably the best. If you want a cable, the UNI or UNI cable company that Alex mentioned earlier uh, has uh, three foot, six foot, and 10 foot USB-C to HDMI cables, and I've had good luck with those. Good, Serge. Yeah, I second the uh, UNI uh, cables. The, that's the only cable I get HDR and everything else I need. But I also use an anchor USB-C dock that way I can have the HDMI and still have USB ports on that same port. Uh, yeah, I have, um, this is the six foot, uh, this is the uni or uni or whatever they want to call them, three foot ones. Uh, they also make adapters. So this this one, you can get a small one that's just a USB-C to HDMI. This one has uh, USB-C and it has um, USB-C, USB-A, and uh, HDMI out of it. So it's a larger one. And these have all worked really well for me. Um, and so that I, I've kind of standardized on there just because nothing fails, you know, so far. Um, and when nothing, nothing fails, I get pretty ad addicted to using just one kind of cable. But I have probably, I don't know, 20 or 30 of them because I just, anything I plug into, I just, oh, I got to buy six. I buy them in like six six at a time. <laughs> Different, like, like, oh, I need a bunch of these. Uh, you know, so right now we have a bunch of uh, my Mac studio has a bunch of you i'm using all the thunderbolts on the outside to go into a 
into a, a ATEM, and that's what I'm using there to keep them all the same. Uh, next question. JJ McKenna in Santa Venetia, California. What is the best conference microphone speaker for Zoom use in a 20 foot by 20 foot conference room sitting on a table with a glass wall? Yeah, I mean, we've, I think we've, uh, um, the, the big thing with that is that, uh, I mean, it depends on how far people have to be and, and how many people are around the conference room. You know, like it's not, is it a person in the conference room or is it a group of people? Uh, the, you know, dealing with the mic systems uh, and, you know, the, the big thing that you have if, a, if you have an open speaker and a mic is, is if you're, again, the Sennheiser solution uh, that, that Mark's talking about uh, is really designed for a lot of that. So I think that the Sennheiser solution, the Microflex solutions, when you're talking about best, if you're talking about cost effective, you really have to really decide what, uh, what the use case is, this is very like, you have to tune it for the use case if you're not going to spend real money on it. So you have to decide if, if you've got the money to do it. I think it sounds like Mark's solution is, has turned out to be fairly effective. Go ahead, Mark. It, it is an expensive solution. I mean, you could buy a lot of high old PR forties <laughs> and put them at each station right. and get rid of a lot of background noise. You just have to manage all that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, next question. Grant Whitehead from Adelaide, Australia. Best bone conduction headset for Unity comms. Go ahead, Peter. Well, it depends on what you're trying to do. If it's just Unity comms and you're off camera, I vote for the Aftershocks comms. I use I use those on a regular basis, uh, and they work really really well for just general purpose. If you're particularly if you're driving somewhere, but that's a different mm -hmm. thing. Right now, I'm using the Aftershocks Aero to listen to comms. Right, mm -hmm. so it's not it's not something hanging in front of my face. But if I talk, people can hear me. Mm -hmm. Good, go Tom. Yeah, plus one on the open comms from Aftershocks. Here they are. Yeah, and and uh, this is my open comms that I got after Tom recommended it. And I can tell you that uh, my producer, <laughs> uh, if I don't wear these while doing almost anything on a phone call, I will be asked why I'm not wearing these. Um, because they are, uh, it's not, the fact that it has a boom and that it has noise cancellation um, means that it is, it, as this is now, if I'm on a phone call with someone, not just for Unity, this is the preferred headset for any phone call. Um, it, the one thing I notice is, this is an important thing, I, I can be on a phone call and do the dishes and no, it doesn't bother people. <laughs> so with, with this one, with the other ones, it's, it's like, oh, what's, what are you doing there? So I don't do that with clients, but I do it sometimes in internal meetings. Um, and so, uh, or if I'm working on something, I can, this is a really, really great one. I will say for noisy environments, I would say the Parrot 450 is got better. It's, it's a much thinner audio, so it doesn't sound as good. But it's it's noise cancellation is is higher and it's also big and boxy because it's going to go over your head. Uh, go ahead, Grant. I was just going to ask what the what the sound is like through the bone conduction, as in you you feel comfortable with I, spoken you know spoken word. You wouldn't listen to music through it, obviously. But I, I have um, listened to music from it, but it's like it's like playing like a little radio. Like if you had like a little, little radio and you set it you know on the table. It's about that good, <laughs> you know, like, you know, and so, so it's, uh, you know, it's not, it doesn't compete with uh, the other head. Like I have the Bose ones that form the, in the ear that N Nigel and I got. Um, and those, I think of what I own right now for in-ear is probably the best. They're, they're actually pretty competitive with my big um, Apple Maxes or whatever, um, as far as the sound goes. Uh, the, um, uh, these are, again, not sound. I find that the audio is great. If you turn it up too much, it tickles. <laughs> if you turn up your, like, if you turn up your, if you if it, have it all the way turned up and someone talking into it loud, it'll literally just like, it tickles your, the side of your, your, your head because it's just vibrating on your, on your cheekbones. But for me anyway, it, it, it works really well. I can hear people very clearly. They can hear me clearly. Uh, what's great about it for me is also that I can have my program ears in and then just take this and set it on top. And so now I'm getting both audio without having to figure out how to wire it. You know, I don't have to, it's, it's usually I put these on first, but anyway, um, but it, it looks a little funky right now, but the, bo the bottom line is I can add these to something and listen to program without, a lot of people do that, but they, they, they find ways to tie it in, you know, tie in the audio that goes into their in-ears. So being able to hear comms, because I don't need to hear it at the same audio quality, but being able to have comms sitting over top of my program is super useful. And again, I, 
I learned this from from Tom. Um, go ahead, uh, Craig. I'm just wondering, are there any wired versions of uh, of these, or, or from another provider? I don't know of any. Unfortunately, I, I not. They discontinued the wired version. Yeah, because no okay. one was buying it. <laughs> so I I actually um, because I had a battery. Well, at first I misplaced these ones. They look remarkably like wires. So they got into a pile of wires, and I couldn't find them because I thought that that was just wires over there, and they it, they had fallen into it, and so. I bought another one. And now what I have is two of these, which I can now, if, if the battery for some reason runs out, it's 10 hours and I've never used it that long, but I've never actually had them run out. I'm always worried about them running out. So I plug them in relatively often, but I have two of them so that if one ran out, I could switch over to the other one um, specifically. So uh, that's how I've handled the not wired thing. Um, but I will say that there, there's, again, some of the better headsets. The other the last one that you might want to consider in a very loud environment for low profile is a company called The Boom. They build the headsets for um, these are about three hundred bucks, and they're wired um, and they're heavy, like they're heavy wires that go over. And it's a company called The Boom. They're out of Santa Rosa, California. They build the headsets for Apache helicopters. And so the off the the you know I I used to have a convertible, and I used to have my I used to be in meetings with my top down with The Boom on, and no one said a thing maybe 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 they could hear it but i would ask like how do i sound and they'd be like yeah you sound fine so so it's so the boom is another one that's kind of heavy uh it's heavy iron to to do that it's 300 bucks for a wired headset but it it, it has the ock the noise cancellation is very good um yeah go ahead craig did i go to you or did, yeah go yeah. ahead uh, mitchell yeah i wonder how well they work with whispered conversation i bet they work great <laughs> next question Next question from Paul Valhus in Austin, Texas. Is there a rolling big TV stand that rocks big time? <laughs> I'm just thinking about uh, how, what, what, how, what does a stand have to do to be able to rock? Uh, anyway, um, uh, Mitchell? Um, I would, since you didn't mention a price there, Paul, um, I'd go with a Chief. Chief makes good stands, and you can get them with a motor in them, they'll raise and lower them, and you might even have one where you got a little tread on it and run it around the room. So that's, that's the one I recommend. And it rocks. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I can't think of the ones that we've gotten for, I mean, Leo uses ones that we stole from the, I, we stole the idea from Leo. I can't remember what they were. They're pretty, they're pretty hefty. The, the, one of the challenges that we had was the monitor didn't go down low enough. And we found that we could uh, literally cut them. So we, we cut them off so they could, we could make them go lower than they were designed to. One thing to think about with the TV stand is how you're going to get the TV up and down. So some of the TVs have, um, you know, some of the TVs will have a, uh, you know, something you turn that makes it go up and down. Some of them you unlock it and move it up. And some of them have hydraulic lifts. And so the one thing that I will cons w would recommend is depending on what you want to do. And if you really want to go all the way, you can buy the hydraulic lift mechanism separately from the stand, from the wheels, and then build your own whatever you want. And, uh, and that you, uh, sorry, I, I had to ask Crayon what, because uh, I, I just couldn't think about what, what this would actually be. Um, hold on. This is, a, uh, this is a, a, according to Crayon, this is a, 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 um, a TV that rocks. You can see it's added rocks to the under. So that's how it, that's how it decided to, to, a TV stand that rocks has rocks in it. Um, anyway, so the, uh, uh, so the, I, but think about building your own. We build them into cases. And what's great about it, what's super cool is you pull the case up and you hit a button and it just goes, it comes right out of the case. And uh, that really rocks. Next question. That is Champion Walker, Mansfield, UK. Has anyone noticed the new highlight color in the lower thirds? And what do you think? And by the way, um, he comments that uh, you have a coordinated shirt on today and he wants to know how you did that. I have a coordinated shirt. Apparently, it works with the lower third. Oh, hold on a second here. So let's see. I, I got to go speaker view. I see everything in a. Um, let's see, pin elevation. I like it. I like it. I like that it fits my thing. I, I think it's nice. I, I give it a thumbs up. Go ahead, Tom. Yeah, it's just a tad darker than the previous color and doesn't take my eye away from the name and location. Yeah. By the way, tad is a technical term often used in TV control rooms. <laughs> It's right there with a smidge. Uh, next question. And Peter Sargent's here from Round Rock, Texas. What's the reaction to the upcoming ILM George Lucas special on Disney Plus? 
I'm just pretty upset that I didn't get in, in, I didn't get invited to the recordings. That's that's all I have to say. You know, like I was like, oh, where, 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 where's my part? Uh, but they had they have some really some a lot of old friends in there that I I could see in the in the background. So I was I'm pretty excited. It looks like it's going to be. I mean, Rose is right at the end. I mean, we all loved Rose. So she's she's at the very end talking. She's the one that says, you know, it's a. Anyways, um, and uh, there's, uh, it looks like it'll be a lot of fun. I hope that they could see this as a success and they just make lots of them. Uh, when I was working on episode one, there was any time George was walking through, anywhere he went for any meeting, they had some, they had John Shank would follow him around and, and shoot video. And there's just so much gold in there. There's hundreds and hundreds of hours. And if they put it up unedited on Disney Plus, people would just watch it. Like they would just sit there. It's like the Beatles. Like they would just sit there and just watch hours and hours. I had to, um, I had to rebuild the pod hanger in uh, for episode one from what they did at Leaveston. And so I had to watch all this video because I was trying to figure out where they put the pods. Like they didn't, <laughs> they didn't document very well. Anyway, so so I had to figure out where they put the pods so that I could send down a a template for ILM. And um, so I got to sit and just watch tape after tape of John Knoll and, and George and walking through these things and talking about things and figuring it all out. And I said, back then, I was like, we should be doing a 10 hour series just on episode one, a 20 hour series. I was like, you can just sell it for 300 bucks and you'll pay off half the film. Like it, like it, it's just so, it was such great content of just some really smart filmmakers and affects people having conversations. It just, they, you know, so, so I'm super excited about it. I think it's going to be great. I think that, um, uh, I'm just hoping that, that people understand that someone at Disney understands that there's no, you're not trying to fit into commercial breaks. You're not trying to, there's no reason not to just throw tons and tons of this content into Disney plus of all these movies. You know, um, so hopefully this is, we should all go watch it and make sure that we at least put our little vote in that this is fun because these are the extras that all of us really want, I think. Go ahead, Mitchell. Alex, I can't believe they haven't asked you to do the uh, stand-in for Jabba the Hutt. <laughs> you never know. Because they found it. Well, nowadays, I don't even know if he's still around. Like he was, he was just a, he was just a stagehand that spoke Navajo. Anyway, next question. Oh, you're not going to do it. All right, here we go. Next question, Albi oh, Lopez. Oh, Excellent. There we go. Uh, Albi Lopez from San Antonio, Texas. Just got my first stream deck because of a second hour covering them. I started to control a Mac Mini, but is there a way to use the stream deck to control a PC laptop running OBS at the same time as the Mac? Go ahead, Craig. Um, to be honest, I don't know in the Stream Deck software itself, but if you're using Companion, it's uh, it's straightforward. You just set that up as an instant. It's all done over network queue. Go, ahead, Peter. Now, that's that's what I was going to say. It's with Companion. It's just what is the IP target of what you're trying to control. It has nothing to do whether it's a Mac or a PC. Just where's the software you're running that you want to control? The Companion instance may be attached to the Mac but it will then talk over IP to the other computers and control whatever there needs to be controlled on them. I do that all the time. Right, yeah, 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 good Grant. Yeah, there's some software I use as well. If you can't, if you can't talk to the software directly, um, but, but you can do keystrokes, um, there's some software called um, Vicrio, um, Vicrio Listener. Um, and so I have that running on a, on a iMac that I sit in the corner um, and I just like I have after hours running on it all the time and I just have a couple of mute buttons and, and, uh, um, active speaker and gallery view, um, buttons on my stream deck that's connected to my Mac. And so it's just super easy. It just triggers the, the, um, uh, the shortcut keys. And so you could do that on any number of, you know, computers around. And, um, if you can't talk to, I think OBS, you can just talk to directly, um, with companion, but, um, yeah, otherwise you can use these shortcuts. Big Creo, it is. Next question. Serge Blondin from Montreal, Canada. Has anyone upgraded Audio Hijack to version 4? And does the up, is the up, upgrade worth paying for? I have upgraded. I don't know if I thought about it very hard. I it, This is one of those apps that I just like, oh, I should have the current version. <laughs> like, you know, they're, they're, they're going to do some cool things. And so I, I did it pretty quickly. Um, and so I didn't, but I didn't think much. I haven't. I mean, looking back at it, I'm glad I did. I looked at the list of the things that they added and I've noticed that it's better, but I didn't, you know, every once in a while I go, oh, that's really nice. I can now do this. And so, so the, um, but, but I, 
I, I kind of, Audio Hijack is definitely one of the ones that I kind of just keep up to date. Go ahead, Grant. Yeah, I did the same thing. Um, I came, it said it was an up, update and, and then I was asking for money and I was just like, okay, take my money. You know, there's some, there's some actual software out there that um, deserves being paid for. You know, there's a lot of free software around, but there's software that I just want to, I want it to keep getting better and still be around and supported. And so I'm happy to just give money to them to make sure that it, that it keeps being around. But I didn't notice any massive differences. It just looks a little different, looks a little cooler. <laughs> it does look like they've added some features like uh, some uh, scripting, which looks really interesting in API scripting. Um, the the uh, a couple extra tools that I probably don't use that much. But again, I, it, like Grant, Audio Hijack and, and uh, you know, the, that company, <laughs> like, so what they're doing uh, is Rogue Amoeba is just a, one of those companies you just want to, I just want to keep on sending them money to make sure that, uh, to do stuff. So I don't, I, I don't think too hard about it. Um, again, if it was a couple hundred dollars, I would definitely think hard about it. But at $29, I, I, uh, I, I just upgrade and chip in to make sure that things keep moving forward. Next question. Benny in London, UK, has the question, if you were covering a sports event like football, soccer for some of you, what are the minimum amounts of cameras you would use and where would you place them? Um, one is the minimum <laughs> that I would use. Uh, you know, you and, and that one really has to get a master shot of the whole field. And a lot of times I feel like that's like what I watch most of the time when I see soccer is like this big master shot of you're, you're trying to see folks that are that are doing the thing. You know, after that, I mean, and, and I'm not a soccer expert, so hopefully someone else raised their hand. I'm just filling time. But, but the um, the ones that we've done in the past from there are um, the. If you think about it, one thing to think about is that you generally, in most sports, you have a reverse camera or two, but almost all your cameras will be clustered on one side. You'll notice that most of the coverage is all on one side. There's a there are some reverse cameras. And when you get into 20, 30 cameras, then there's more reverse cameras, but but usually most of the work is all done on one, on one side. So you start off with that master shot. A lot of times then you have ones in the corners that can just get the angles that the master shot can't get. Then you start adding ones that are on the field and usually where most of the action that people care about is, is near the goals, you know? So that's where you're gonna put um, these cameras on, on um, you know, close to the goals here are the ones that people start to fill in. Then you'll have ones that are raised up on either side behind, you know, you have the, the folks that are, you know, you have the sideline here and you'll see them that they're, they're kind of raised up ab above that so they can shoot over the heads, but they're more at line of the, they're not coming in from high. And then you start getting into the, the big ones that are, that are over here. And those are gonna be the, all of them have these big long 100, 100 X lenses on them, but they'll be all up here. And then again, as you start to add these, once you, you'll, you'll for every two or three that you add on this side, you might add one on the other side as far as coverage goes. Um, but that's what we see mostly when we're looking at um, of, of sports coverage. Go ahead, Grant. I've, I've worked on on uh, soccer games quite a little, quite a bit. I was uh, I did two soccer games this morning with my kids. Um, <laughs> it wasn't, there was no cameras there though. Um, in the stadium that I've worked at, um, uh, and it's broadcast and so there's lots of cameras um but the, definitely the the minimum is that wide shot um right. that it kind of comes in a little bit and just follows the ball but it's very wide because yeah. the ball can move quickly and you always want to see the ball the next one that you want really is at at head height you know kind of on the sideline because you want to be thinking about um pre pre-game post-game you know like um in the breaks um, and in the interchanges as well. And so if you can, if you can, when there's subs in and out, you can get a shot of that, them running in and out. That's something that happens. Um, and so you'd have the, sort of that middle, middle shot that you can then still get the goals and then you'd be thinking about the goals. And so then you'd have more down the ends. And so now you can see that you, you can see how sport just adds up and up more and more and more cameras. But, you know, it was like one, two, you know, it, you could kind of do a two two camera with any of um, our broadcasts. We talk about a three camera shoot because you always want to have a couple of different angles that you can cut to. And if you lose a camera at any point, you've got something else to cut to. So, I guess I'm saying you need three cameras. <laughs> uh, next question, Mike Beardmore in Reading, UK. Can you recommend a port expander for use with a Mac Two Pro M2 Pro by a sound and video artist? Go ahead, Mark. 
So OWC makes a number of these. They make uh, some that you can attach HDMI and, and display port to. They make another one that's very nice that has three additional uh, Thunderbolt ports, but also allows you to put more storage in, M.2 storage in. And they are the same form factor as the Studio and the Mac Mini. Go ahead, Mitchell. Plus one on what Mark just said. Yeah, and, and I plus two. And, and the main thing is, is definitely... Uh, if you're going to use a Mac, definitely take advantage of the Thunderbolt opportunity than, than rather than USB-C expansion. You're going to get a lot more throughput, and it's a lot more stable. Next question. Next question in from Douglas Carmichael. Wouldn't there be issues with a lag if you're running Mimo Live in the cloud? From my experience on my 2013 Mac Pro, Mimo Live is heavily CPU dependent, and running a 1080p stream can make network I.O. and other tasks lag quickly if you're not careful. Good, Peter. Well, he sort of answered himself in his own question. One, uh, comparing an M1 Mac Mini or M1 enabled Mac to a 2013 enabled Intel Mac is is a is a bit like uh, apples and kumquats. I mean, it's just so far apart; it's not even funny. Right. The other thing to remember is Mimo Live on a on a, has been optimized as a version six for the M1, so for the that architecture. And Amazon, at least maybe you guys can tell me differently, but from my commercial data center world, I've never run into a problem with data center bandwidth out of any of the Amazon data centers, inside or out of the Amazon data centers. Yeah. So and- as long as they've got the M1, and I, I, I'm going to guess they went ahead and got the build order version that in t- includes the uh, Mac Mini with the 10 gig ports, there's not going to be a problem. Yeah. The, the hardware, the CPU is fast enough and the network connection is fast enough. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And, and I think that uh, the the last Intel laptop, you know, Mac Pro souped up uh, is probably 10 times faster than the, at least at least eight times faster than the 2013 Mac Pro. Um, you know, just the, the, and that was the last one before it went to the M1, M1 and M2, and the M2 is probably twice as fast as that. So... Uh, you're probably talking, you know, a, a, at least one order of magnitude plus some of of speed that would be in the new in the new Mac uh, Mac Minis. Now, I will I will say that the version five of Mimo Live still had to go through that Rosetta two right. stuff for a while, but version six does not. Yeah, it's great. Uh, next question. Douglas is back with a question. We've discussed different methods of scheduling yesterday. How do you balance being able to respond to the unexpected quickly? to the unexpected quickly while not overburdening your crew with constant changes and little time to properly implement them. I go ahead, John. You prepare in advance by thoroughly training everyone so that when they're in the event, they're using tacit knowledge so that they're not thinking about their job and they can consider and think about the situation and respond to it. Um, Some key features are things like lots and lots of practice, having um, different redundant systems. So you have multiple people who can do the same thing. If you have shrinkage in your staffing, so you can apply more people to the problem, as well as um, other training type materials, like having assessments, assessments to make sure people can do the work. And then you throw unexpected situations at them before they need to, so that when the time comes, they're already ready for it. Go ahead, Grant. Uh, I just give a little uh, bit of a run of show um, perspective. Um, because we're talking about minutes and seconds and things can change. Um, I've used things like, and I heard the show yesterday talking about things like Showflow. Um, I've used Showflow quite a lot and it works, uh, it works really well. One of the, one of the cool features of Showflow is that you can follow the show caller. So, um, so wherever the show caller is in the program, everyone else is there as well, which means that Changes can be made on the fly, as it often happens in in live shows, um, but everyone is just sitting at the row that the show caller is on. Changes have made, and the next thing comes down, and now you're you're sitting and only seeing that row. The interesting thing is, though, um, I was involved in um, a a, uh, um, a TED um, uh, a, a TED event here in Australia that was was not a um, TEDx. But the team from TED came over to run this one in Sydney and I was working with them and we were using Showflow um, and it was one of the first times that they'd used it. 
And I said, what were you using before? They're like Google Sheets. And I'm like, would you, would you go back to that? And they're like, yeah, we'll probably end up back on Google Sheets <laughs> just because it's so flexible and easy. Um, and so one of the things that we've done with using uh, Google Sheets is that we highlight, you know, we hide things that have happened previously and we highlight where we're up at the moment and then we can continue to make changes and we also use calculations, formulas on all of the times so that when you do make a change or someone runs long, all of the timings are still active, are correct and are going forward. And you do calculations for how long the break will be now because they've taken more time, things like that. So there's lots of fun in that. I will say, yeah, we, we tried them all. And I think the show flow is actually really cool. Um, I just, um, and Rundown Creator is really cool for show shows, not so much uh, for bigger things, but... Uh, but I, we still on a day in day out, lowest common denominator across all the teams is Google Sheets. You know, everyone kind of understands how it works, and it's really hard unless you have a regular team to do that. The other big things with changes is beyond what John was talking about as far as training goes. For big events, I hire people that I didn't train, or maybe I, maybe I was some part of their their knowledge base, but they're you know they've got ten, fifteen. 20 years of live experience. Um, you know, they've worked on hundreds or thousands of shows and, um, and they bring, they know more about, my general rule is every, pretty much every person that I put in a key role knows more about their role than I do. You know, so, and, and you've seen some of the folks there, you know, that have worked on some of the stuff that I've worked on, whether it's uh, Mickey or, or, or Brian Maddox, you know, um, uh, you know, Nate <laughs> coming in to, to cut shows. I mean, Nate knows, both Nate and Brian, I've worked with Nate and Brian on a lot of shows oftentimes together, and they each know 10 times more than I do about their job. You know, like, in, in, and so, uh, and so you, the, the goal is always to get the right number. You don't always get this, so you're always trying to get, but you're trying to get those kinds of folks on your show if you can afford them. And then you try to keep them at about 40 to 60% capacity. So, um, so now you have a ton of experience and then you have headroom. And the mistake that a lot of producers make with live, especially when they're getting started, is they have uh, people who don't have a ton of experience and then they run them at 120%, you know, and they'll do that for a little while, but you're just putting yourself in, an, in, a, in a place that will fail. You know, and that's why a lot of live events fail, not just live streams, but just live events fail is because small producers hire people with very little experience and then and then have them juggling like six different things instead of doing what they're doing. You know, when we have big jobs, we have, you know, Brian might be working on the audio, but when we needed to do something else with audio, we brought somebody else in. <laughs> we brought, you know, and then when we, you know, Nate was, we were like, this is too many cameras. So Nate's directing, but I brought another TD in to actually cut the show. So Nate's just, all Nate has to do is call the show and and uh, Bob, in this case, was uh, was doing cutting the show, and Bob has twenty years of experience, you know, doing it. And so then, what happens is, is you end up with two people with twenty or thirty years of experience, cut one cutting the show and the other calling the show. And because they're so experienced, they can just handle almost anything that happens on the fly. Like someone asks for something to do it, and and then we've got a a record. The recording person has fifteen to twenty years of experience, you know, of recording. Like 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 that's what they do, you know. And then you have the graphics person has that, and they have a great tool to do it, and. And so, again, that's on the high end, you know, but the, the point is, is that you're always trying to do it. And the reason that we leave office hours open, you know, and we people can come in and train is because there is no replacement for lots of hours. And when I say lots of hours, I don't mean, oh, I did office hours two or three times. And now I understand, I understand how it works. There's no replacement for hundreds of hours of time. Like it is. And, and being able to like get to a point where it's unconscious and natural and everything else. And the problem in production and why we're gonna keep on making more and more production opened is the problem with production is, is that you, uh, that it's very hard to get that experience in live because if you screw it up, they don't wanna hire you again. Like you don't get that, you know, so you have to find places that you can either go to a school that does it, go to a place that you can volunteer, go to somewhere, but you got to find somewhere to put hundreds of hours in, you know, and we're going to keep on trying to figure out again, the office hours and the birding with Lois and the Tony Mobley process is preparing a large group of people all over the world to do like the, what I was talking about earlier with that event, you know, those kinds of events. If, if a lot of people decide that's a good idea, 
there's no, there's very few people outside this group that know how to do it. <laughs> so, so, um, you know, suddenly there's going to be this huge sucking sound and there won't be anybody in it if we don't, if we don't train people to do it, but it's not just training. It is experience and it's it, doing enough hours that not only did you figure out how to do it, but you've seen lots of things go wrong and been able to figure it out because the team also, when they've seen lots of things go wrong, they don't panic. They just go, oh, like you've, I've seen incredible things happen and, and, clients will come up to me later and they, you'll, they'll see a whole bunch of things go wrong. And our team doesn't even like, doesn't bat an eye. They're just like, suddenly everyone's calling, okay, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do this or this. And boom, you're just, you're just turning again. But that doesn't come from learning it. It comes from experience and going through failure and finding the other side of it and knowing that you can do it. Um, next question. Douglas Carmichael asked, with Amazon introducing M1 Mac EC2 instances, and Mac Stadium offering them as well. Could you see Apple themselves introducing a Mac to go service to consumers where you could rent a Mac in the cloud per month and stream it to your iPad? Go ahead, Mitchell. Uh, we talked about this a bit yesterday and the consensus was no, Apple sells hardware. They don't sell virtual instances. Uh, go ahead, Peter. Well, again, and actually you mentioned earlier, I mean, there's already, Amazon has added it and there's already been, uh, and I forget the name of the company. It was Mac. Mac stadium. stadium. Mac stadium has been doing it for years. Right. Mm -hmm. And Mac and Apple's never chosen to get into it. Technically they have. So, so, so Apple does have a, a service that they've been rolling out um, for developers to be able to have uh, instances in the cloud which is, I mean, not instance of the cloud, it's just Apple putting up a bunch of Mac minis. So there right. is an Apple service. I don't know if they're going to ever, it's been primarily something that they talk about in relationship to developers. Um, it hasn't been, but it, and it's still in its infancy, but that was, I think, not this WWC, but the one before. It is, but it's not general audience. Not, not yet. <laughs> you know, if you were going to start somewhere, you'd start with developers. Um, but but the uh, but it is something there, so the developers can scale up testing um, to it. And so, and I think it's come at mixed reviews so far. I think they're still getting it figured out. I still think that Amazon will be the big game. I think Mac Stadium will still have plenty of. I don't think Apple's going to replace that anytime soon. But they do have some some cloud services that they're putting into place, and they they may continue to move that direction. Uh, next question. Eric Nathan in Bellingham, Washington. What are your most treasured shortcuts, tips, or tricks for Mac or PC? Go ahead, Grant. One of the coolest things I, I set up was a um, an automation script uh, because for receipts that I need to send to, to my online booking, uh, like a accounting software, when you would send a PDF, um, it will only show the name of the PDF. And often that name of your invoice or whatever is you know, a bunch of numbers or something that doesn't mean anything. And so I made a little script that um, I would just hit print. And so it would be in the print menu and it will um, set, I put a dialog box for you to enter the name, um, something that's helpful. It will then rename that PDF, as, uh, attach it to an email and send it to my um, accounting software. So it was just super simple. It's just a real little um, in print menu. Um, rename the PDF and send it an email. So it's one of my favorite little ones. There you go, John. Using modifier keys uh, with the arrows when you're in a text field. So if you hold down the command with the right arrow, you'll jump straight to the end of the line or either direction or up or down and control goes word by word. If you hold down shift while you're doing it, you'll select whatever you're um, jumping through. It's uh, really helpful. Serge. So one of my favorite I just showed my girlfriend last week is Command Shift Three. We all know it's taking a screenshot. Command Shift Four to do an area screenshot. But if you keep control at the same time, it's just getting that screenshot into the uh, uh, copy and paste, and then you can just paste it where you want. Uh, Tom. Okay, my lighting in this room is 3200K. I'm also surrounded by monitors though. And so I set my system every day to go to night shift because otherwise I look like this. <laughs> uh, go ahead, uh, John. Oh, my name wasn't on the list. Oh, there, it popped up yeah. finally. Uh, two things that I was taught by uh, 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 Golner. Um, Remember they took save as out, out of way of most of the apps. If you hold the if you hold option mm -hmm. key, save as comes back. 
so and funny. Huge. And the other one is you can pin your own number on message where you can do text messages. And there's got to be a better way to do this. But sending information from my phone to my computer, I still use Messenger to send stuff back and forth. I pin my name up the very, very top. And then I cut and paste information back and forth between I, my phone and my computer. And I have to, I do that with notes. So I, I, I have a, a notes or my, if for some reason I can't get from a device, like right now, for some reason, my calendar uh, on my Mac has broken. Like it's just, my calendar doesn't update, but my phone stays current. So I have to keep on looking at my phone. Like, what are my meetings? And everybody's got a blue jeans link or a zoom link or whatever. And so there's this one long, I have this one note that just has lots and lots of links because I just go copy and paste this over. And then I click on it and I join, I join the meeting and, and until I figure out why my calendar stopped working. Um, uh, next question. And it's from Eric Nathan in Bellingham, Washington. What are your biggest peeves in production? Nice try, Eric. I'm not going to whisper. Do you have any stories that drive you crazy? Go ahead, Mark. I yield my time to the representative from Delaware, Mr. Mitchell Hill, to complain about whispering. <laughs> Go ahead, Graham. Go ahead, Graham. Uh, uh, I think it's just uh, um, not being professional um, in, any, in, in any way that, that, that happens. So you can determine whether whispering is professional or not. But um, no, in a, in, a, in a production, like in, in an event, um, one of one of my pet peeves really is um, is social media, or, or, um, or sitting on phones and and messing around. Like you're not being attentive to the show, and I don't I don't care how boring the show is, how simple it is. Um, I, I think I might have told the story before. I was working on a show, a, a large show at, at the International Convention Centre in Sydney, large show in the theatre. Yes, it was only one lectern mic for the audio operator. Um, and one day I turned over, I turned to him, I was sitting next to him, show calling. I turned and he had the whole audio console was full of receipts. He had all these receipts all piled up and he was basically doing his book work. Yeah. And I was like, okay, that's not great. And he kind of, he kind of got the idea from the look that I gave him and he, you know, packed it all up. The next day we're, doing, we're back in there and, uh, and I was busy, did a bunch of things, very boring very boring session going on. I look over, the, the dude's got his iPad on the console and he's got cabled earbuds in and he's watching Netflix. And I, I look over at the guy and he pulls one of his earbuds out and he goes, too much? I'm like, way too much. <laughs> way too much, dude. <laughs> so that's a pet peeve. You know, I got to tell you, like I, the one thing that you, almost everybody in my crew is super focused, you know, when they're, you know, when they're there and, you know, they're getting paid good money to do what they're doing and they want to keep doing that thing and they stay focused. And what happens is, is I notice that they spend a lot. Now, I, I, there are certain people that I trust. Like I know that if Brian is on, if Brian's on, on his iPad searching around, he's looking for something about the, the, the board. Like he's, you know, so what happens is when things are slow, they're researching things that need to get better. They're trying to figure out. And, and so they're using that slow time. The best operators are using the slow time to pull in more information about it. And how do I make this one little thing a little bit better? And they're researching something that's there. And, and during the show, they're just paying a lot of attention to what's happening when the show is live. I definitely agree with Grant that, that pretty much if you have a screen, here's the funny thing. Uh, and this is important for you if you're, a produ if you're someone working on a crew. Producers, Grant actually talked to that person. I wouldn't. I would look at that person. They would do the thing. If I thought that it was affecting their ability to get, if, if, if they miss cues, then we'd have a conversation. But outside of that, I probably wouldn't say anything. And then I'd never hire them again. That's the, that's the thing that you have to be careful of with, with um, producers is that a lot of producers won't tell you anything because telling you means that you may be upset now and you may be worried and you may make more mistakes and you may now talk a lot about how this production is all messed up and blah, blah, blah. And, and so, so what happens is, is that, is that the, um, so producers don't oftentimes won't tell you anything. They'll just they'll ride the show out. They'll make a decision that you're not the right person. And then you go down on the list, <laughs> you know, and, and you're never very, if you really screw it up, uh, you may get to a point where you're on a, what we, what we tend to call a DNC, do not call. 
you know, so DNC in our, in our lists means that that person did something that was bad enough that we won't ever call them again, but that that's pretty rare. Um, usually what, what you get is, 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 uh, just you're lower on the list than you, than the other folks. There's, there's one, you know, there's a hierarchy. When a show comes in, we call this person, then this person, then this person, then this person, then this person to fill that space. And you, where you sit on that means how often we call you, you know? And so, and so the thing is, is that, um, and we're constantly making those judgment decisions all the time as producers. And so the thing is, is that you, you have to be really careful of not stepping into that, you know, and, um, you know, we, we, you know, they're being late, but you, you know, we, we always say that there's, there's like a bunch of steps that it takes to get under the bus you know, to get in front of the bus, you have to step, keep on stepping forward towards the front of the bus, being late. It's definitely being late is get you is a step towards the bus. It doesn't mean that that's the only thing that will get you in under the bus, but get you there. Um, you know, and, and the other thing that does not being communicative and I'm, I'm the worst at this. I have to get very better, better at it because my phone automatically goes into do not disturb all the time. Um, because it's just, I don't like notifications. And so, so the, um, but when I'm in production, I turn that off so that I can respond. And generally in production, if you text me, you'll get it. If you're in the production, you'll get a text right back or, or whatever. I try to be as responsive as I can. Um, so not being responsive, uh, complaining about the production. So that's why we give people RFIs, type it in there. If you talk about it during the show, I probably won't hire you again. <laughs> you know, like, you know, like, like it's, you know, like I just, because it affects the energy of the entire group. You know, like it just, you know, affects everybody, how everybody feels about something. And so you want to address it and you might ping me like, oh, this, is, this isn't, we need, we need to fix this or whatever. But usually trying to keep that, not spreading it out among everybody else. And you should never underestimate how much producers can hear, you know, like, you know, like it's, uh, you know, and so, um, and then, you know, talking about politics or religion, those are good ones to get not called back because again, it affects the entire team. Even if they don't say it, you have to be very, you know, like that. This is what I think people don't, they're not aware that even if people aren't talking to them about it, it means that they're being affected by it. Um, you know, those are the kind of thing, being loud, you know, um, talking about food a lot, that, that annoys me. Like, where are we going for dinner while we're in the middle of a show? It makes me a little crazy. You know, like those are, it's a lot, there's lots of things that, <laughs> that make me crazy, but definitely social media and being on stuff that is obviously not work. That is a huge no-no. Um, yeah, go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, I know I was baited into answering this, but I'm going to mention it because what the heck, it's Saturday. Um, Mickey likes to whisper in my uh, headsets on comms sometimes when I'm uh, talking. And it drives me crazy. So, Mickey, you're fired. No. Well, wait, we need you. Wait a minute. <laughs> we need you so you can stay. <laughs> you know, wait until they start. You know, I'll start whispering. I, I, I need to get back on, get the comms so I can whisper like in other languages. I'll be like. And then, then he, he'll have to figure that out too. All right. Well done. Good Saturday morning. I, so I, I kind of like, uh, so there were, there was a, there was a couple questions that popped up that were about like, how does office hours do this? I'm really pushing those to Sunday. They're great questions. And so, um, they'll, you know, put, go ahead and put those in, but, but for next, for tomorrow, but I'm trying to kind of clear the deck on the one Monday through Saturday. So if you ask questions about office hours itself, if it's self-referential, you'll probably get pushed to Sunday. Like it'll just get pushed to push back to you and just put it in on Sunday. Um, I'm, Cause it's just for people who are listening, I'm kind of getting, pre continuing to prepare us to be on a bigger platform. And it doesn't, those kind of self-referential questions don't, don't make as much sense. Um, I do like that Saturday, I've consciously kind of slowed Saturday down and allowed us to like, dig into questions and talk about them a little bit more than, than during the week when I'm kind of moving a little bit faster. So there is a kind of a iambic pentameter to the thing, just so you know, like it's not by accident that we answer questions longer on Saturday and Sunday. Um, and on during the week, we go a little faster. So, um, so anyway, so that's the, the just, just so that the little inside baseball there for at the very end there for you. Um, if you're, if you're listening here, but, uh, thank you to the producers for all the great questions. It was a great conversation today. A lot of great questions. And, uh, thanks to our panelists. It was a good panel today. Really a lot of people I don't see very often. And, and, uh, so, um, so it was really, I like the Saturday sessions when some of the folks who can't come during the week, uh, come in and, and, uh, answer those questions for us and be part of the, part of the conversation. So thanks for coming in and, um, thanks to our, uh, our, our, our um, staff in the back end, our volunteer staff that makes this happen, the crew that makes this happen every single day, seven days a week. 
I like the the Tlaloc traversal. Let's keep adding it and figuring out where to put it. It's cool. Um, we did, I, I am trying to make sure that we let people know how much we traveled today. T today was a pretty busy day. Um, we tr the total distance traveled during this conversation was 70,010 miles, 70,010 miles. Uh, so it would have been hard to do this in person. Like this to, to do the show in person because we we covered uh, a lot of the globe, seventy thousand miles or one hundred and twelve thousand six hundred and sixty nine kilometers. So we want to keep it there. So it's you're it's welcome. Yeah, you're yeah, welcome. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Grant added a lot, a lot to that to that uh, calculation. So so anyway, so there there we go. Um, and we'll we'll keep on trying to keep you updated every every day on 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 where we went with that. All right, time to jump into after hours. Still great show i need to like give people more prep that i'm gonna i, I just stopped the sentence and i just went okay now we're gonna start and then like, dum, 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 dum. i can just imagine that in the background so i gotta figure out a better way to slow down a little bit and say now we're going to stop the show really slow but it will I'm going to get you, Mickey. See, after all this time, Mitchell still can't figure out how to whisper. It's not that hard, Mitchell. It's fun to whisper. It's weird. See you guys. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.